Matt's Day? Your favorite prospect. My favorite prospect? He can't be in the majors, so it's not like one of those prospect eligible guys like a Wyatt Langford. That's my rookie anyway, but in the minor leagues. We kicked off our Baseball America partnership yesterday with Hot Sheet, and it's great. But who's your favorite prospect? I mean, I can't choose Jackson Holiday because he's going to be in the big leagues in three seconds. So my yeah. favorite, James Wood. Anytime you're in the bushes and you can hit oppo dingers and center field dingers on the reg, I'm, a, I'm in your corner. Mm-hmm. I'll go Charlie Condon. He, He's at Georgia. Yeah. He probably will go number one. Come on. So my, uh, so my friends, I have two friends. Yeah. We call them the Pauls. They want Charlie Condon on the show so bad because one of my friends, the Paul, is works with Charlie Condon's dad. And he's like, you need to know who this kid is. And I'm like, dude, I know who that kid is. <laughs> and he's like, you got to get him on your show. And I'm like, no. No? How he, about on Hot Sheet? He goes to Georgia. Oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy must own a boat because if he's your friend and he goes to Georgia, you still talked about him. So... Well, no, my friends, the Pauls. One of them is the 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 Prince of Austria. Are you hmm. saying the Pauls or the Pauls? The Pauls, two Pauls, <laughs> like a Paul, like a like a dog Paul, or like Paul Pauls. Pauls. There's P A U L S. Paul. Two different Pauls. Two Pauls. Two Pauls. Two Pauls. One of them is the uh, Prince. One of, of them Austria. is the Consulate General. His great grandfather was uh Franz Ferdinand who got shot to start World War One. Stop. Stop. Oh, these I'm aren't real, oh, these oh, aren't real people. You don't you don't live in a real world. You this live is a real in person. Some fictional Austria this guy needs to come on. David Condiff or whatever his name is needs to come on. Charlie Condon, who's gonna be number one if you want to learn more about him. Hot sheet, check it out after this show. I mean not another one, but we already did it. Here it is. Hot sheet. JJ Cooper, Ben Badler, and Carlos Colazzo were with me. We ran the show live yesterday. It's up there for you. Also, podcast-wise, give it a sub. It's live 3 o'clock Eastern, but we did talk drafts. And I mean, if, we can get Jack Tawney, probably. Do we want Jack Tawney? I don't know if, I don't isn't know if you're up like messing media. with me with these people or not. Jack, Jack Caglione, Tawney. Jack Tawney. Yeah. Oh, the lefty from uh, Florida. We from can get Florida? him on. No. So anybody who went from Wake Forest, we can get him. We can get him. Chase Burns, maybe. Yep. I thought that's a we're gonna have a weekly gonna guest on Hot Sheet. Maybe. Are they allowed to come on FT? Why not? Mm. Are we too mean? So. No, we are. They're just not in the bigs. All right. We've had some college players though. That's fine. I mean, we can figure it out. Let's do it. I know. I know. Uh, uh, Carlos Colazzo. Yeah, AJ wants Kags one one for sure. K- uh, Hey, Carlos, he's probably not going 1-1, but he can hit some dingers and he can throw 97 So from the left side. So you tell me why he's not going 1-1. <laughs> Love that. And he's going to be a hitter, Carlos. I mean, I know Carlos is in the chat firing questions at me, but he's probably going to be a hitter. He's 6'5", 250, lefty, hits to, led the nation in homers last year. Uh, also dates one of my daughter's friends at Florida. Wow, we're getting all the facts. Mm-hmm. And I thought you were kidding. Carlos is, is in the house today. No, Carlos is literally firing questions yeah. at me. Love this. All right, last thing, and then we'll get to the news. Are the Pauls in Florida? Pauls live in Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sound like they own Atlanta. Atlanta. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, what, yeah, I mean, they, they work for Amazon, and they do uh, Amazon buildings. So, yeah, they pretty much own the world yep. at this point. Ugh. Yeah, one of my packages is late. I'll know who to call. <laughs> no, don't call them. Yeah. They build. They build the warehouses. Exactly. I'm getting a job next Christmas at Amazon. Okay, I, I know some people that can hook you up. One yeah. of them is named Paul, and the other one's named Paul. <laughs> I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work at home. We get so many packages. It'll be an at home job. So, also, Kratz, if you need a warehouse, AJ's got a guy. Mm. Uh, that's that's good. That's you good. need 30 yeah, million square foot warehouse. Yeah. Let me know. Actually, warehouse raves are a big deal. So if they want to get into that business, if there's ever like a light day where there's, you know, 
not many packages in the warehouse we could set if you want to unsubscribe to foul territory to this this morning would be the day to do it because we haven't <laughs> hit on anything pertinent about what happened yesterday in fairness i would say 90 percent of the time we get to the lead story within one minute yeah okay so i mean listen you should subscribe because this is the kind of banter you're going to get yeah exactly <laughs> sometimes you just need we're this. just going to talk about all the people that kratz knows <laughs> <laughs> it's over next <laughs> <laughs> what what's, wait what's the what's the most common name in your area where you live kratz moyer uh, ishmael moyer landis All right, so you, you got two landis friends the landis <laughs> the landis land the land all right and the harpers actually are in your state too let's charge the damn out Not one, not two, but three home runs for Bryce. He had been hitless. Six RBIs. Capped it with a grand slam in the bottom of the seventh. The other two were solo shots. And Eric Kratz can take a deep breath because his MVP candidate for this year is back. Still in a, still in a distant second to, to AJ's MVP candidate, but Mookie, there's time. Mookie, Mookie, there's, Mookie, Mookie. There's time. Especially Mookie plays if, a premium position. Mookie plays a premium position. Eh. Real question. Look, is is Bryce Harper more of an MVP candidate at first base than he is in right field? Or it's like, eh. It's thing. less. Of, for me, it's less, less at first okay. base. But Mookie's only hitting 500 with a 1,700 OPS and hit his fifth homer last night. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, three homers, six RBIs are nice. You're still behind. There's that. I mean, yeah, nice, nice night, but you're still looking up. They were even saying it on the on the game last night. I'm watching this thing, and I'm like, my buddy's at the game, and he texts a picture of me before he hits the homer. He's like, wow, great game to come to. I'm like, brutal game to come to. Like, it's raining. You're one of the only people there. And then he's like, yeah, but Bryce could hit three home runs. And then Dinger hits it. And the telecast was saying, why are they even throwing to this guy? Why is this even a thing? And then they got to the point where Trey Turner got the three balls and they're like, well, I guess you got to throw something middle, middle for Trey and ball. Uh, there it comes. Poor Brent Suter. Nobody can make a play behind him. Well, I mean, it was bound to happen. I mean, announcers jinx. They were like, oh, he's 0 for 11 on the year. Whack, Homer. You know, Todd Callis we had on yesterday, announcer's jinx. He doesn't believe in announcers. it. I don't believe in it. Actually, he believes in it. I don't. They were actually talking about it on the Astros game last night. The exact – Todd Callis and Jeff Blum had the exact conversation we had on this show last night on their air, and I text Blummer and I said, you tell Todd Callis to give us a shout-out because this is the same call conversation, and Blum goes, no, he won't do it. He's an asshole. <laughs> and I'm like, exactly. He gave you the content. Literally the same. I'm talking. It was. He's like, if I was on radio, I'd be saying it every second. And he's word like, for word. He said, there's a million ways that I could say it without. And I'm like, dude, this is the exact conversation you guys had on our show the last two days. Nothing. And we're nice to the Astros. Well, fair. Let's put it that way. Yeah, we haven't yelled at them for anything. Yeah, we're neutral. I mean. Some shows hate the Astros and just like can never get over the trash can stuff. We just treat it more like a joke, but we're just sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bryce Harper did blow his perfect game with a faux pas at first base. Ground ball to second base. Stott is up with it. Two away. Over to third is India. What happened with that one, John? Well, well, there's a runner on third, and Bryson Stutt threw it to Bryce Harper, and Bryce decided to throw it around the horn. <laughs> he, threw it, he threw it to Trey. <laughs> Trey's like, what? One faux pas, though, in the, in the game today was when uh, you threw the ball around the horn with the runner on third. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that. That's great. <laughs> oh, man. What am I doing over there? <laughs> You know, when I just threw to that, I was like, I never say faux pas. I don't think I've ever said that word in my life. Where did that come from? I was like, oh, wait, I saw the clip already. <laughs> mm, faux pas. But did you also see the faux pas in the uh, Blue Jays-Astros game where the Blue Jays didn't show Altuve getting picked off at third? during They were they were replaying something else, and uh, somebody went to second, 
like just walk, uh, somebody went to second and then all of a sudden they're showing it and then all of a sudden Altuve gets banged back pick at third and they didn't even show it. And they're like, yeah, the inning's over. We don't know what happened. But, oh, wait, never mind. Altuve got picked off. So they missed two things, right? Just and somebody they, went to second. Right, and they were clueless on that. They one. had no idea why he went to second. Yeah. Then they fell behind, right? Yeah, and, and then Altuve missed. backpicked from Kirk and the inning was over and they're like, we don't even know what happened. We'll show it when we come back. Mm -hmm. Are they still doing this? Are they still doing it remote? They have to be because there's no way Dan Schulman and Buck Martinez. No way. Are they still that remote? live? They're still remote. They might MTV? be, but there's no way Dan Schulman and Buck Martinez, two of the best announcers in the game, especially. I mean, I'll listen, Dan out. Schulman is one of the greats, and Buck is awesome. There's no way they were. Maybe not. they zoned out though. They, they, Both they can't zone out when you're watching the game. I don't. I, I mean, I don't know. Their radio is remote. Not TV. I think it's Blue Jays and Angels still think it's COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's got to be something. Something happened. Yeah. Hey, let's get to Mookie. MVP. 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 Oh, we're watching old stuff? Let's just put on highlights of Bryce Harper winning the MVP. Other years. <laughs> I watch old, old videos. I mean, this didn't even happen during this domestic season. Now we did. got. Now yeah, we got is. extra. Now we got real homers. Well, that's against St. Louis, but he's got five total on the year. He had one yesterday against San Francisco. Dodgers edge the Giants. It's not great when you have the Dodgers going bullpen day, Giants going Cy Young number two from last year. Logan Webb, second place finisher. They have a few guys that. That get to him, but still. But Logan Webb didn't pitch bad. No, no, he didn't pitch bad last night. He pitched he fine. Faced I mean, the he Dodger. Got... Yeah, I mean, he didn't shut him down. It wasn't like Tyler Anderson against the Marlins status. But there he is. You know, I mean, I guess. Well, I take that back. Three and two thirds, five earnings. Is, I thought he went. Oh. I thought he went five innings. But sorry, so apologize. So three and two thirds, seven hits, five earnings. Yeah, that's not great for Logan Webb, but. How come still you're facing Brazier, Yarborough, Vassia, Grove, Phillips, and you lose? That's you're counting that one if you're the Dodgers as a win. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a giant, you're like, all right, Webb versus bullpen, we should win this one. I, I was curious. They were like close to game time. It was about minus two hundred money line for the Dodgers. I was like looking. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna hit this game, and I was like, minus two hundred money line. Are you kidding? Did you? Uh, I did not. Chickened out. I was thinking about run line, and I'm glad I did not. No, I we'll get to we'll get to some games that I did hit. I hit two games yesterday: our heater and your game. We'll get oh, to it. We got to save, oh, save it. What a win! Wait, what one, a win for the good guys! One more question. One more question. Okay. Um, on Mookie, and yes, here's a rando fan saying: You ever just randomly feel bouts of pure hatred for the Red Sox for trading Mookie bets? Actually, yeah, I do. I mean, I don't have a horse in the race, but I do because there's just no reason that they let him go. How come Mookie can't hit homers in the Derby and he might hit 40 this year? Because like, Derby, no one cares about. I know, but most dudes can show up and do that. You know how he just couldn't put it together? I need some hitting analysis on what the difference is. In the Derby in the regular season? In the baseball? In the well, season? Like everyone else at the Derby can basically hit him at will, right? And Mookie was, in my mind, in a class of his own. For once. Well, first on of all, Mookie's end. smaller than most guys, so it, it, it's the biggest thing, and he gets tired quicker than most guys. So in a game, plus he's locked in in a game, the ball's coming a lot harder. Uh, so, so it's pitch speed. It's just a combination of things, plus just he, he ain't a home run derby guy. Right. But he'll he's going to win the MVP this year, and I'm going to look like a genius. He might have 40. Him and Soto, my picks. How about how about the fact that he's just kind of what AJ said? He's not as big, and the dudes that are winning those derbies are monsters. So they're getting tired and still hitting the ball 450. I would be hard pressed to think if you look back at what's Mookie Betts' farthest home run in his career. Like I bet he's eclipsed 450 a handful of times, under five but he can put the ball out of the ballpark. So it's a difference between dudes that can actually like easily eclipse. Like look who wins it. Look who, I mean, Pete Alonzo, Ryan Howard, Prince Fielder, Bryce Harper, dudes who are 
hitting absolute nukes because you can get tired and your your best bolts are still way farther than you know Mookie Mookie being able to not that he hits wall scrapers but just keep that longevity and his draft stock is through the roof right now for the MVP race and if he stays on the field and He's 20% less than what he's doing now offensively. He's a lock. Yeah, but I saw where he was uh, first. I don't know if it was yesterday. First uh, outs above replacement at shortstop also. Outs above average at short. He's leading? He was. I thought he was. I I thought I heard that or saw that or he was something. Because he's played two extra games? Mm. Yeah, but you can also hurt yourself on those games. Yeah, what if he clanked a a bunch of balls and he would be not. He hasn't. He's unbelievable. That's it. Mm Mm-hmm. MVP, MVP. Next up, overreaction the Wednesday. Yankees. That's right. Nope. Truth the Wednesday. Yankees are done. Overreaction mm-hmm. Wednesday. They yeah, can't handle a- elite pitching. Uh, the Diamondbacks won. The Yankees finally lost the game. If you watched our show yesterday, you would have known what happens. Zach Allen dominates. I'm telling you, I heard multiple stat nerds. And sometimes I'm one of them, but I heard multiple stat nerds worried about Gallon's well, stuff down. And especially if he gets one. that pitch. Well, that's true. <laughs> but his stuff looked pretty good to me. And that the Yankees are patient as hell. And I think they worked still three walks against him. I mean, the at bats are really good. There's quality at bats from them, but Gallon's, Gallon's still Gallon. Gallon's pretty good. Yeah. So and Nestor was they were all over him. He's See his pitchability is through the roof. If that's hard to comprehend, it's basically why I think your pick is really good too in George Kirby. He has great pitch ability. He can change. It's like guys who can swing and hit different pitches for damage in the gaps. Like you can't just take one swing or throw one pitch in one place and expect to have success. So so what if Gallon's velo's down? He's able to pitch off of that. Like he's able to pitch off of that curveball even though he's only you know touching 92, 93, to me his arm strength might increase throughout the year, and he's pitching so well, and his pitches all look the same. And remember back last year, Max, Max Muncy said the one fastball, because he's to me he's the best besides Juan Soto, best fastball hitters in the game, he said Zach Gallons. Zach Gallons is the toughest for him to see. That's for him, but put that in your pocket. Huh? Well. Diamondbacks are good. Diamondbacks are a good They're team. Really they were good. good. I mean, I think they went to the World Series last year. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. They I was did. there. I saw it was a while ago. Yeah, it was games. a while ago, but I think it was. Their offense is better. Yep. Their starting staff is better. It, it will be for sure once yes. they get everyone back. Once they get Eduardo Rodriguez and Montgomery back, but Callen's been a stud for three years now. Mm-hmm. So not Callen's a surprise here. But the better question for me too. was now now that the Yankees have lost, who will lose a game first, Pirates or Brewers? Give me a sec. All right, and now that the White Sox are not winless, <laughs> the Marlins are the last team left. So will the Pirates or Brewers lose before the Marlins win a game? So I'll go. And, uh, and I'm going to caveat this with the Marlins already down 2 nothing right now as we speak in the first inning. <sighs> Marlins are going to lose again. Twins are going to win. That game's going on against the Brewers right now. And the Pirates will win later. That's my results for today. And that pretty much answers your question. So the Pirates. So the Pirates are going to be undefeated. The Marlins will still be winless. Mm -hmm. And the Brewers are going to lose. Yes. Okay. What do you have? And then we'll bring in our guest. Well, I think the Marlins are going to lose. I love A.J. Puck. Go Gators. Um, But they're down 2-0 in the first. They're bad. Uh, Wow. Why are they so bad? We're going to talk about it. Bad, bad. Um, Who do the Pirates play? The Nats again? The Nasty Mm -hmm. Nats? Trevor Williams against Yeah, I'll take the Pirates again. Keller. Keller, Keller Mitch really Keller. good. Yeah, that's a um, I'll take the Pirates in that game. And then Chris Paddock, the sheriff, is on the mound for the yeah. Twins, although they're first and third when they're first and second, no outs. Sorry, live What's updates. What's the Tigers' record? <laughs> Who? The Tigers? Tigers are undefeated. Tigers are undefeated Ooh. also. They're not going to play until they're next They're probably week. not going to play that until was, next month, as, that, as, that Gary, as, Gary, as Gary Cohn has <laughs> so eloquently put us, put it, told us last night. <laughs> All right, let's get to our guest, and then we'll keep running through the games because there's a lot to cover. 
But this is an important topic right now, and you know our show is all over these stories. Let's bring in Sam McDowell, who uh, covers Kansas City sports and the Royals and the ballpark situation going on right now. And you can follow him at Sam McDowell 11. We'll post some of these clips during this conversation on FT Twitter, too, if you want to check out his handle. Sam, great to have you on here. Appreciate the time. And, of course, we have you on here for a very good reason. The city voted down the ballpark plans for the Royals, and I I guess the Chiefs side of things, too, which I need more context on. But how are you? And enlighten us. Yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, so it was on the the, the ballot uh, yesterday in Jackson County, actually. It was an extension of the existing sales tax. It would go for another 40 years for the Royals to move to a downtown stadium. I mean, um, I know you guys have, have been to this uh, the, this area and you know where Kauffman Stadium is currently situated in a suburb area and the Royals want to move downtown but um, the voters voted it down and, and a landslide victory. I think a lot of people that I had chatted with thought this would be close. Um, and I don't know that the results stunned people, but the margin uh, certainly did. 58% voted no, 42% voted yes. And so now you've got, and you're right, that, that I should mention that the Chiefs were attached to this project as well. And that's something that I think the Royals thought would lift their boat as well um but it didn't and so now you've got a couple of teams that i I think the what's next for the future is a valid question a lot of people are going to look at uh, a move potentially obviously we're in a different sort of environment here in kansas city where you've got something right across the state line that could represent a move but what's next becomes a big question in addition to uh the teams need to look at, at why this happened the way it did now tell us the political landscape is frank white is he still is he still on the the part like the, that kind of voted this down? Is he going to not be invited to any more Royals uh, alumni events? It's it's been a really interesting dynamic um, because Frank White is one of only two players who has his number retired by this organization, and he not only was not supportive of this project even after the Jackson County Legislature. And I know I'm getting a little bit into the weeds here, but after they um, Uh, voted to put it on the ballot, he tried to veto it and he did veto it. And the Jackson County legislature had enough votes to override his veto and go ahead and put it on the ballot anyway. So what you saw really for the last six weeks to two months here in Kansas City was Frank White uh, campaigning against this. And in fact, he was part of the celebration last night when this did not pass. And I think a lot of people outside Kansas City would look and say, what the hell's going on there? We have one of your former Hall of Plant Hall of Fame players who says this is not a good deal, but he's the county executive in Jackson County um, where this vote happened. And he's been really adamant that the county deserves a better deal. So what are they looking for? What 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 is everybody looking for? Baseball always has owners that don't want to put any of their own coin in. But if the Chiefs get behind this, is there a little bit more like, whoa, if the Chiefs, if the Chiefs are out, we can't lose the Chiefs. The Royals, eh, we'll wait and see what the Chiefs say. Yeah, I mean, this this town loves these two teams. And you mentioned, I mean, particularly the Chiefs. And what better time for the Chiefs to go to the polls than after winning three of their la- three of the last five Super Bowls in the NFL? So that should speak to the errors that this project had, that despite this town's love for these two teams, they were still only able to generate 42% of the vote. And when you ask what, what they want, I mean, what the voters wanted was more details about what this exactly this project was going to entail. The the Royals project in particular was a moving target for the better part of the last 15 months to where voters had a difficult time latching on to the reasons this was was happening. It was not a consistently well articulated message. They switched which site downtown they were going to, to try and attempt to go to as late as February, two months before a vote is when the public learned where they were trying to build the stadium and and that location currently has a lot of businesses it's an arts district in downtown kansas city and there were therefore a lot of questions about what it meant for those businesses and those questions were just not sewn up yet and therefore despite this being a really long process it still felt like a rush to the finish line over the past couple of months okay what, what what's next sam besides them both teams moving to orlando and we can do the same thing they did in Kansas City. We can put the Chiefs, the Orlando Chiefs, and the Orlando Royals right next to each other. Are you, who's paying? Is Will Orlando? Well, pay Orlando for it? pay for that. We have plenty of tourists. Trust me, we're like okay. Vegas. We have tourists, 
tourists and more tourists. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, but we, we can, we can do both here in Orlando. So what's next, you know, how, how are we, they going to build these new stadiums in Orlando and not Kansas city? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> that's why I said. It's, it's a different dynamic in Kansas city than it would be in other places, just because you've got a whole different voter base in a different state, you know, 20 miles down on I-70, um, the exact same highway they're on right now. Um, so I think you will see the Royals have, and particularly more so the Chiefs, have a willingness to listen to other offers. And it's it's long been uh, the worst kept secret in this area that, that Kansas is interested in having these teams here uh, on their side of the state line, particularly the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, the Royals, I think, is a bigger question because a major emphasis and point of their entire project was to go downtown, to be in the vibrant part of the city. And going across the state line to Kansas does not solve that part of the equation. And so I, I think you see them more likely, and this is still a big unknown, I wanna, I wanna underscore that part of it, but I think it's, it's most likely that you see them in some form or fashion, try and make another go at this, whether that's trying to get the city more involved, because this was a county vote, it was gonna be a county tax, um, or you know, try and go back to the county in, in, in some form or fashion. But I don't think it, that could be immediate. I, I think you're looking at something that even could potentially be into next year or afterward. All right, so, so what, would they really move to Kansas though? I, I, I know, listen, I get it, Kansas wants them, and I know it's 20 miles, you just gotta cross the river there, but would they, would they really do that? Because Kansas City is obviously the big draw. So it makes too much sense, right, for them to move into Kansas City, into the main city. And I've played a lot of games in, you know, Royal Stadium out there, Kauffman Stadium, and, you know, you stay downtown in the plaza or you stay downtown in the Power and Light, and then you bus out there to Kauffman Stadium and Arrowhead's right next to it, and there's nothing out there. There's literally nothing except for these two stadiums. So No, there's a Taco more... Bell. There's True, a Taco there's Bell. A ta there's a Taco Bell and an Adams Mark. I forgot about the Adams Mark. Yes. Until the team well, the Adams Mark has been closed down for three years. So the exactly. Adams Mark's so. Yeah, so we're left with just the Taco Bell and a gas station over there. Uh, you're right, AJ. I mean, it's 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 the reason that the Royals have wanted to move to a more vibrant part of the city was because there's not development around there. In fact, part of the Chiefs' ask for this this tax was not going to include more development around what's called the Truman Sports Complex that, that houses both of those teams. So um, that's why I, I still ultimately think that the Royals are going to try an avenue that still somehow puts them in downtown Kansas City, but the second go round is going to have to come with a lot more fully fleshed out plan, a, a lot more details than what this first one had, because you never know exactly what motivated a voter to vote the way that they did. Um, but that should be part of the Royals research over the next you know, days, weeks and months ahead. And I think they're going to find that a lot of it was just not what a, a distaste for the project that they had but a distaste for not knowing exactly what the, what the project was going to entail. Sam, how much of this has to do with the public not wanting to fund bills for billionaires? Because new restaurants, attractions, and all kinds of other things that exist around the country don't get funded like arenas and ballparks do. So I think a lot of people are always scratching their head and wondering why they're supporting a billionaire who can afford it themselves. The reason I think this doesn't pop up as a topic as often is because you usually can't vote on this. And I was in Miami when the new ballpark was being pitched and all of that, and you literally read the corruption in the newspapers at the time, you didn't have a chance to vote. You know, Vegas didn't have a chance to vote to not accept John Fisher's bullshit. So how much of this has to do with fans just being like, if you want to do something, just pay for it yourself. That's how life works. Yeah, I mean, you certainly heard that sentiment when these projects were announced. And that gets back to what I said about that. That's going to have to be part of these teams research is to see how much of that weighed into this vote. I really don't think it was the overwhelming majority of the 58 percent of the people that voted no. And, you know, to, to be fair, I, I should point out that these teams were not putting in nothing. I mean, the, the Chiefs had announced that they were putting in three hundred million dollars to an eight hundred million dollar renovation. The Royals had announced that they were going to build the ancillary development around the stadium. Then they they priced that at about a billion dollars. Um, that is not what the taxpayers were going to pay for. They were going to pay for the stadium part of it. And the Royals had announced that they were probably going to pay for around around the neighborhood of about three hundred million dollars of that part of the project. But um, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be a faction that has that distaste, and and that that faction's growing nationally. And so I think that was something they encountered 
maybe even to a heavier degree than they expected at, at the onset of this project. And so that gave them an additional hurdle to cross. And then when they were unable to, to cross the other hurdles that, that came their way, I think it was a message that some of the no voters latched onto, but I just don't think that that's the major reason that this failed. I think you could have gotten more than 50% of the vote, even knowing that that faction of the, the community exists. When you see a team like the Royals do as bad as they did last year, and then go out and sign as many players, veterans, like two legitimate contracts. They weren't just, you know, they weren't pirating. They were, they were doing, going out and finding guys, three-year deals and, you know, extending wit. Did it feel like they were doing all this to sway the vote or was it just a coincidence? Because to me, that's what it felt like. Oh, new stadium. And look at all the guys we got. I think it's a combination of both. I mean, we, we'd, we'd be remiss not to mention the fact of the timing that you just said. I mean, they, they needed to prove to Kansas Cityans that if they invested in the team, the team was going to invest in itself as well. Having said that, I do think the Royals sense an opportunity in a weaker AL Central division um, that they think it's more open than probably it, it, it was last year, probably than it could be in a couple of years. So why not use the, the opportunity to go for it now? And again, to be fair, I mean, John Sherman spent more money um, than really we, we can remember in, in, in Kansas City as far as its baseball history. Um, I mean, they, they spent as much money as anybody did over $100 million dollars. Um, on, on it, it, that includes, of course, player options and assuming those might be accepted at some point. But they've got a team that I think could at least be competitive in AL Central Division that's not all that competitive. So it's the marriage of the two that just really happens to work out really well timing wise. Sam, is there any way to hold accountability after these moves get made? So, I mean, the Twins, for example, end up getting that move. They say we need to do this to be able to compete with payroll and all of that. And then this offseason, they slashed payroll. And I saw it. I mean, just go to social media. Fans are like, yo, you said you had to do this to, to compete and keep the payroll at a good level. And we just finally made the playoffs and won a series. And now you're going backwards. So, you know, how are you supposed to trust that the other side's going to do anything? It's not like they're going to put a clause in there that says we'll have a top 15, 20 payroll. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the accountability piece. I think it's it's people like us, right? I mean, it's, it's those of us that, that are talking about this pretty consistently. Um, and to your point, I mean, a lot of these uh, Royals deals are short term deals like they're not investing in, uh, you know, three and four year deals for these free agents. Um, it's the Bobby Witt investment that is a long term investment. And that that contrasts a, a lot of what used to happen here in Kansas City. And I actually think that that contract itself can have a, a trickle down effect on future free agents to say, hey, look, that the, they're star players that we are used to that organization trading away at some point. Now we know they're hanging on to one of them. So if I go to Kansas City and sign there for multiple years, that guy, that cornerstone piece, that MVP caliber player is going to be there for the long haul too. Sam, we appreciate the time. Thanks for some information on this. And obviously you can follow Sam, like we mentioned, at Sam McDowell 11 and check out his stories in the Kansas City Star. Appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. You guys do great work. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, figured it was good to get a little more information on that whole story and what's going on there. because It's a huge story in Kansas City, and I don't think it's gotten a ton of national coverage, but it got voted down with authority. Right, let's get back to games. That's what he said time. Mix in some thoughts on games. We will go to the Houston Astros since it's panic mode there right now. <laughs> Absolute panic mode. It's a good game. They were in control for almost the entire game. Fromber was in control. Dominated. Although in parts of it, I'm like, is he dominating or is the Blue Jays offense? Not that good. We shitty. asked that last year. Yeah. Good looks good on paper. What, what does Ken Rosenthal say? Paper Tigers? Paper Tigers. Paper Tigers. Don't, they got to they gotta get rid of that moniker. But he did exactly what he didn't do in his first game, talking about Framber. Framber was throwing the sinker. He brought it up. It was either a strike or they were hammering it into the ground. I mean, he had no walks. He was through seven innings with 76 pitches, I think, or six innings, 76 pitches, whatever it was. He was doing it, and it didn't look like it didn't look like he was 
nibbling quite as much. And not to start a controversy, but who was behind a dish for the Astros? Yeah. No, no more Martin Maldonado, Yanner Diaz. No, last night was Caratini. They put Caratini. Oh, was Caratini behind the dish? So it's one of those things. You, you you mix and match that kind of stuff. Joe Espada wants to wants to try to get the most out of his guy. I'd be hard pressed to believe that Caratini's not back there again the next time Framber throws. If it matters, it matters. It's one of those things. I think it's blown out of proportion, even as a catcher. But if it matters, if it if it makes a difference, you ride that until it doesn't make a difference. But then Josh Hader blows the save in the ninth. Davis Schneider with a two-run home run. And Schneider post game, he's great. He was like, damn, I was surprised he didn't just go all fastballs up. That's my kryptonite. He literally said that on the post game interview. He's like, slider up? Okay. That was my chance. Got him. They gave yeah. him a chance. I, yeah, I don't know. Also, well, I guess Yonder Diaz did DH, but I mean he did mm -hmm. hit two homers a game before and caught a no hitter. You'd think he'd run him back out there, but you Especially know. since the same team's in town. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I mean, he did DH. He didn't. He didn't catch though, which is interesting. Like I don't know what Framber and Yainer Diaz have, but there's something going on because they're saying why he's not catching him. Yeah, but I'm just still trying to figure out why he threw him a slider. Yeah, no there it is. I don't know what that's going to do. I, I don't know what the choice there is. Like. Like, what were you hoping to accomplish? Were you trying to backfoot it? Because I don't know many backfoot sliders from Hader that I've seen over the years. Especially, like, that's that's just like, hey, this is easy. This guy can't hit the fastball up. We're going with the heater. Mm -hmm. Well, Dana Brown, GM of the team, said, I want the fans to know that the sky's not falling. You don't need to panic. I agree. I personally agree. I think this team can rattle off. Some big ass win streaks this year. Agreed. They're losing some close games. I mean, they lost four to the Yankees. They do a no hitter. So they won one game and it was a no hitter. I mean, mm -hmm. what would have happened if they never threw the no hitter? I guess we'll never know. Nope. But also, it's like you had leads in three of the four games against the Yanks. You were up until the last out last night. Yeah, I mean, they, they could be five and no. Yeah. Let's at least four and one. I mean, they yeah, they, they could well. be five and one. And, and yeah. we had we've had Blum and Callis on here the last couple of days. And you know what did they say? You know the the getting to the six, seven, eight has been the problem. Well, Farnberg gave him enough to get right to Hater and still messed it up. So I mean that, that three headed monster we thought of of Abreu, Presley, and Hater has not been what we thought so far. It's early five, again, six games in, but it's hasn't been what we thought it would be to start. If I were in the NL West and somebody asked me a question about the Astros right now, I'd go, I'm really excited about the way our team is playing. And they'd be like, well, what, are you about, what about the slow start for the Astros? I'd be like, I'm really excited to see how our team plays. I wouldn't poke the bear because these guys will figure it out and water levels out. So they're going to start to do well. I think Montero, I think he's going to have a good year this year after a down year last year. I think those other guys who have been dominant for years, it's not like they've just had one dominant year. They've been dominant for years. They'll be fine. And now, well, that's what he said. Yeah, that's what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> that's what he said. That's what he said. Oh, we fancy now. So the Marlins suck. They're 0-6. They made the playoffs last year. They got shut down by Tyler Anderson last night. They might lose again to the Angels in this series as that game's rolling. Here's Avi Garcia from a few days ago. We just didn't get to this. Quote, we want to have results. I want to have results. Last year I was hurt. This year I'm healthy. Every time they put me in the lineup, I want to do my best. It's not good for players to hear that the first at-bat of the season, they strike out and they boo. That's not good. I don't like that. It's the first time in my career that happened. Fans are fans. The game looks easy from the stands. I understand it, but it's not fair. Should he say that? <laughs> Why not? If that's how I feel. You got, I yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm just curious. Would I say it? No. But mm -hmm. if he feels that, he's there for a while. He knows he's underperformed, and I think he he felt frustrated. Do I think the first – First at bat of the year, you 
you get booed? I don't know. Was there? I guess there was fans to start the year, but there's very few fans in there, so I'm sure you, he could have picked out the guys who are booing. <laughs> it's just Bob here's, and Tom. Here's that's the thing. all. And you... <laughs> I mean, he didn't. He was hurt all like all last year, right? A good he, chunk. He, I good, mean, most played, of it. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he probably there. played. My guess would be okay. 65 games, but I'll he, check. Here, they're 0 and five. Right, 0 and six. 0 and six. 0 and six. And last year he played 37 games. Even so, he was hurt most wow. of last year. Oh, okay, it happens. It's early in the year. You guys are 0 and six. Guess what? Fans are frustrated. You're frustrated. It happens. You know what? The fans have a right to do it. Is it cool? No. But do you have to deal with it? And, and it's never happened to me before. Well, you've also played on some really good teams. At times, you played on some really bad teams and teams people don't care. The, the Marlins came into this year after making the playoffs. They didn't do much this offseason. But, hey, fans are like, at least we could be competitive. But to go out the gate to the Marlins and the Angels and be 0-6, yeah, fans Pirates are frustrated. Angels. I mean, yeah. sorry, sorry, Pirates and Angels. But yeah, they should be frustrated. They should be frustrated. It's not. A, it's not a thing on you, Avisel Garcia. I know you think, oh, I'm look at me, I'm big bad, obviously, I L <laughs> Garcia. But it's not about you. It's about just a frustration in general. It just happened to be you, and good, he stood up and said, "Hey, I don't like it. Nobody likes it. I liked it when I was on the road. You know, nobody <laughs> likes getting booed at home, but on the road, yeah, right. Because they don't boo. They don't boo you because you aren't." They usually boo you because you broke your, their heart. So I'm all for it. And you're getting booed yep. by 100 people. Yeah, well, another good point. Did you ever get booed at home? Stadium. AJ? Did you ever get mm -hmm. booed at home? Uh, Yeah, San Francisco. Like, I don't know why. Well, I actually, do, I actually do know why. Because thou who should not be named, he's a terrible writer in San Francisco area. His first name is Andrew. His last name is Shitterly. <laughs> <laughs> um, wrote an article about me without with random anonymous quotes, and uh, from that point on, yeah, I got booed a lot at home. But I, I mean, I ended up having a good year. We missed the playoffs at the last game of the year. I got DFA'd and saw with the White Sox and won a World Series. So thank you, Andrew, for writing that article. Wow, that is a thank you. Wow, yeah. imagine what life would be like. I mean, listen, I went to arbitration, won arbitration against them. They paid me more than probably should have, but oh well, too bad. Not sad. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but, yeah, I mean, listen, a certain guy wrote an article. No one ever admitted to saying what he said anonymous quotes because I went into the locker room, called them all out, all the pitchers, and no one stood up. I mean, I heard who it was later, called him out afterwards. He swears he didn't say it, but whatever. But, yeah, I still see this guy when I do Giants games, this writer, and he acts, he won't speak to me, and I – and the other last time I saw him, he said he introduced himself to me, and I go, "Oh, I know who you are. I'll never fucking forget who you are." <laughs> well, if that anonymous player said he didn't say it, then can't you sue for one of those libel, slandery kind who of cares? things? I mean, this guy's I a know. hack. This guy's a fucking hack. <laughs> so all because of that, the fans were being oh, they were all over me, and I actually had a pretty good year. I mean, listen, I hit behind Barry Bonds, okay? I hit into a bunch of double plays. I hit, I don't know, I'm throwing numbers at random, 270 double-digit homers and over 70 RBIs that year. Now, listen, I hit behind Barry Bonds. I hit into a bunch of double plays. Yeah, but Barry Bonds was on first base every single time I went up there. So if I hit a ground ball, it was going to be a double play. Like, okay, yeah, I knew that. And, listen, we won 90 games, I think, and lost, missed the playoffs on the last day, something like that. It was it wasn't a great year, but it was a good year. And they ended up DFAing me for Mike Matheny. And I went to Chicago, won a World Series. Yeah, it changed your life. You know, yeah. You don't get DFA for that season. Don't don't give me the ground ball double play stat is why you get DFA'd. That is <laughs> Albert Pujols always led the ground ball double plays. He was pretty damn. Well, I got DFA'd. Yeah, Actually, is... because what because what happened is when I went to arbitration, they told me. If you go to arbitration, we you'll only be a giant for one year. I said, okay, great. And then I won, and I go, still only one year. And they're like, we're not friends. And I'm like, you said I'm only going to be here for one year. You were right. Oh, well. That's a bad Wait, threat, what? dude. That's your right. What do you mean, what? They said you'll only be here for one year, basically like threatening you. Like if you don't sign this pre-deal, mm -hmm. then we're not going to keep you for the last year, and you would become a free agent? <laughs> No, it was, my first it was my first arbitration year. Oh, that was your first year? 
so I hit arbitration one, and at the time it set the record for the catchers for the first year arbitration. Mm-hmm. And before I went into the room, I was in Phoenix and whatever the hotel is, and I'm sitting there, and Brian Sabian, Ned Coletti were the GM and assistant GM, and we talked. You talked to them before, and they go, they they called my agent and said if he goes to arbitration, he will only be here one year. And then so I'm like, oh, whatever, fine, I don't care. So then we go into the, we get to the room, and Brian. Sabian and Ed Coletti come up to me and they say, you know, you know, once a giant, always a giant, you know, even after this trial. And I said, but you guys said for only one year, right? And they're like, oh, no, that's not, I'm like, that's what you guys said. As if your agent wasn't going to tell you? Like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'm like, come on. That's a bitch move. And it was what it was. And then they lost and then they really got chippy about it. Wow. Yeah. That's that's there you go. Actually learned a lot there. That was good. Did it, right, didn't so know then, it was going to go down that. Be careful what I questions like it, you ask. That's a, that's I'm a, here for it. Had no idea. I'm well, here for it. And listen, it worked out. I mean, it, 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 it's the truth is the truth. I mean, I mean, whatever. I mean, listen, it, it, I went to San Francisco again. I, listen, I got to play with Barry Bonds, who was the greatest hitter I've ever seen. No, no one's even close, right? Live in San Francisco, which is a great city except for the weather when it's freezing cold in August and it's 40 <laughs> degrees. Mm-hmm. But everything else is cool. The travel sucks, too, because you're far from everything. But ballpark's sick. Ballpark's sick. I mean, oh. listen, Scott Air, awesome. Scott Air, Barry Bonds, you know, a lot of guys on that team were awesome good dudes. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I played with – I got Pedro Feliz. I mean, there was a, a long list of guys that were really awesome dudes on that team. Um, so, listen, but it got me to Chicago, and it worked out. So, thank you. Thank you. So before we get to our next and they, guest. Wait, and they retired my jersey. Wow. <laughs> that's what they meant. Yep. <laughs> Eat us an arb and we'll retire your jersey. One more that's what he said before our guest, because this actually plays to what you were talking about, the team that you ended up with. So Jason Bourgeois, the first base coach, was MIA for a bit yesterday. You want to backtrack to the – show yesterday you can see it we got the explanation today the media finally mustered up the courage to ask about it Pedro Cafol White Sox manager said he was in the clubhouse with his headphones on reviewing the team's outfield positioning when he was late to get out to the field after the rain delay Cafol said quote I'm good with it because I know what he was doing yeah but he, he was late <laughs> I mean just tell him to come out what is he he, he gets special treatment because he's studying Does that mean no one else preps I'm confused should have just said, yo, our bad. That was that was a mess up. Miscommunication. He needs to be out on the field. Apologize to fans for waiting. Apologize for the team. Tyler Matzek's throwing freaking warm-up pitches again because he's in headphones and our communication is so lost that we can't even tell our first base coach to get on the field. Am I missing something? Well, they give you an announcement. Don't crap. He said he was in there looking at defensive alignments and with his headphones on. But here's my question. Just say he had to go to the bathroom. It, it, and everyone's like, okay. But my other thing is, so he, okay, he's in the coach's room and I look, and I played with Jason Bourgeois and I like Jason Bourgeois a lot. Well, my question for him is, did you not look up and be like, nobody's in here? Cause they give you like a, Hey, we're starting in 20 minutes, guys, get ready. And they, everyone comes in and is like, all right, we're going in 20 minutes. The pitching coach goes out to get the pitcher ready. The manager goes out. The other coaches go out. Like, did no other coach go, hey, dude, like, we start in 20. It, it, it just it just would have been so much easier to just say, he was in the bathroom. Sorry. Okay. People would have been like, oh, we've all been there. I don't know. I it's totally agree. It. it makes them it's look such. amateur. It's, uh, that's what it makes him look like, especially when Pedro says, I'm okay with it because he was doing – I know what he was doing. What? So then where are the rest of your coaches? Where, where's everybody? Like, was he – did you guys lock him in his locker? Like, I don't know. It, it, just, it just seems weird. It seems – not that it's unbelievable, but it, that it's more just like – like clean it up. Is this the first moment for the White Sox where we're like, oh boy, there's, you know, yes. What is it? What is it now? They got saved by Garrett Crochet shoving, AJ nailing that they were going to win their first game. Ronaldo Lopez was really good too, mm-hmm. and they needed that extra Andrew Vaughn blue pin. Blooper, blooper. Because <laughs> Marcelo Zuna had a day, a three-two dub for the White Sox. So props to them. They're 
off the schneid. But That's, but yeah. again, just just say he's in the bathroom. Why do we have to make up like even if this is what he was doing? It's still better just to be like, hey, he was in the bathroom. Like I, I don't understand why we're like, oh well, he was. I know what he was doing, and and he was had his headphones on. He was looking. He was reading Eric Kratz's book with his headphones on, and no, and nobody. But that, that, that what's weird is it didn't that make you look worse because don't, shouldn't a coach be like, hey, bro. Like, cause they had a top of the eight too before the rain delay, so there was a whole thing where, like, I've been locked in. I've been locked into my whole thing, and like with my headphones on or whatever, and looking at my iPad. And I still would look up every once in a while and be like, "Damn, where'd everybody go?" <laughs> right? Like, damn, wait. Oh, there's a TV. Right? Oh, wait, we're hitting. I better get out there. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, right? Am I wrong, Kratz? Oh, 100%. You never feel that comfortable where you're like, even if you're taking a nap. Huh? What? What? Where's everybody? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Somebody, it's just, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder, right? I'm so glad it happened with the White Sox. I'm it's so just, glad. It's awesome. <laughs> I felt like Pedro Cafo was trying to like push a flex on everyone saying, oh, well, we're, we're stu- sorry, we're too busy studying. So that's what I mean. It's just so little, weird. That's even games. dumber. That sounds even dumber that's to me. Just it's be like, hey, he, even if you're like, hey, he fell asleep. We didn't wake him up. Okay, we've all been there. We've all missed our alarm. Right? Yes. It's rough. All right. Better times in the AL Central for the Tigers. Cody Stabenhagen joining us right now from The Athletic to cover a team that's off to a great start if they can just get – the weather out of the way. Cody, great to have you on. And I'm sure they're pissed that Mother Nature is getting in the way of their undefeated streak to start the season. What have you seen so far? Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. I'm uh, definitely trying to figure out my own travel plans right now. It's a, it's a mess here in New York, but definitely a good start for the Tigers. You know, they opened the series with a, a sweep on the south side of Chicago. Three one-run games. It was uh, close. It was um, hard fought. And the Tigers put themselves in position. A.J. Hinch managed into some really good matchups. The players executed. The bullpen was locked down. And then they come into City Field, a pitcher's duel, a scoreless game. This game ends up going into the 10th, and, and the Tigers busted open and open it extra innings. They win 5-0. Uh, so four games in, a team that has started really slow the last three, four years. I don't think they could ask for much more right now other than maybe the ability to actually play a game after back-to-back rainouts. Are they good? That's it. That's all I want to know because I picked them to win. (laughs) Are they good because they beat the lowly White Sox, who did just beat the Braves, so that's that's enjoyable. So maybe they're, they're a sneaky team, but they beat them by one run. Are they good? Yeah, the wins count, right? But uh, I, de- I definitely still have concerns about this team's ability to hit. Like we saw, scoreless into the 10th against the Mets. You know, uh, I think you can feel pretty good about where the Tigers pitching is at the bowl. How the back end of the rotation holds up. You know, some things to like offensively, but it's, it's a lot on the backs of young hitters. I think there are going to be some peaks and valleys. I worry sometimes that the, the offense could be what holds them back from being able to win the Central. Well, here, here's the thing, though. They won, right? I don't care if it's by one run or by 20 runs. They won the games they were supposed to win. It was freezing in Chicago when they were there, so they won. And then they went to the Mets, and they found a way to win an extra inning. So I don't care. Tarek Skubal looks like a beast. Foley at the back end looks like a beast. Shelby Miller has been unbelievable for them coming out of the bullpen, right, in extra innings or to, to close games out or whatever he needs to do late in the games. So, I, I mean, I think this team is, is legit – especially in that division. So I don't want to hear, you know, the Scott Braun, they haven't played anybody. Like, they're where they're at, and they have a chance to be good and win this division. Yeah, and, and look at how the schedule plays out. You know, they got a doubleheader against the Mets, then they're playing the A's. Pirates are also off to a great start, but I don't know that they're fearing that matchup. Uh, it's a pretty favorable start to the year, and I, I wonder if that matters with the young team, right? If they can get out, establish some good, positive momentum, at least keep things interesting into the summer. Some of these young guys get a little more experience. Uh, health is a big factor with any team. Tigers haven't had great luck in the health department the last couple of years. If they can continue to stay healthy. Um, it, it, that could be really interesting as well. I do ultimately think it's going to come down 
uh, to the bat? How can you how can you produce runs throughout the course of the season? Cody, what would you say is the biggest weakness right now for the Tigers? If things don't go the way that they have planned, what would be the problem? Yeah, I, I think probably what I just said, um, you know, and I think you can feel pretty good about the top half of the order. Uh, Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, Kerry Carpenter, Mark Canna, who's a veteran guy. Uh, you get a little deeper, you get to the six, seven, eight, nine spots. I mean, Colt Keith's uh, a really talented player, but he's a rookie. Javier Baez, can you get anything more out of him? Who knows? Um, they have some role players that they mix and match really well, and Andy Abanez, Matt Vierling, uh, guys of that ilk. But, you know, you compare it to some of the legit, legit lineups in MLB, the, the Rangers, the Astros, you can kind of see the difference if you just put it on paper. Uh, I kind of think it's the bottom half of this order that they will have to continue to really maximize production from, you know, for things to go well. What, what is the team's plan with Casey Mize? Somebody that has not pitched in two full, two full seasons. And now we have all these delays and you still have like, now Scoobles ready to go again. Like, are they going to, baby him is the wrong word, but like, obviously they're going to mitigate his, or, or be able to control his innings. But is it like, well, Google's on five days, so we're just going to skip over everybody and go right to them. Have have they give you any in or have they give you an insight on what they're how they're going to handle him? Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard anything differently. I wouldn't be surprised if they go Mize and Scoobal tomorrow. I think it's important for Mize to pitch. He's already had a long layoff. In terms of bigger picture, so far AJ Hinch and the Tigers have said, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna run him out there like normal. We're gonna let the game and his health." dictate his innings Uh, i think that's important to casey earlier in his career he kind of did these three inning starts to govern his innings a little bit Uh, he wasn't a huge fan of it he ended up getting hurt anyway you know i think if mize gets into august september and he's at 150 innings it'll be interesting to see do the tigers consider slowing him down or anything to that effect but it sounds like early in the season they they want this guy uh, to go like nothing's wrong. They want him to go like normal. And if he's pitching well, they're going to give him some leeway. Uh, what have you seen from Javi Baez so far? Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's been rough. It's not a great situation. There's there's no real way to sugarcoat it. I think we've already kind of got the full spectrum of Javi Baez this season. Every now and then you, you still do get the good Javi. Uh, opening day against the White Sox. Gets one base, steals second, ends up scoring the lone run in that game. You know, made some good defensive plays in that series. Um, and then you get later into the weekend a couple strikeouts with guys on base in big situations. You, you, you hear the boos. Uh, he got booed in Chicago. He got booed at City Field. He might just get booed in Comerica Park as well when the Tigers have their home opener. Uh, I think the big thing I was looking for this spring after an off season where supposedly there were going to be a lot of adjustments and his back was going to be healthier, what actually looks different. And I think there's a little bit less of a, a leg kick in his swing, a little bit less of a coil, but you kind of break it down and his bat path through the zone is still really, really long. He, other than the, the minimized leg kick, he isn't doing a ton differently at the plate. Um, you look at his results through spring training and early early this season, I definitely think it's concerning. I think the Tigers are hoping they can get plus defense out of the guy um, and, and can you continue to make him like a positive war player. Uh, but the reality, you know, there there's $98 million left on this contract. I'm not sure where it goes in another year, two or three. This team is looking to win. So is they, are they just looking for defense out of him in the sense that like what Javi Baez – do they do they need for this team to do well? Because Torkelson is going to hit his 30 homers. I think Kerry yeah. Carpenter has a shot. I think Riley Green stays healthy. So he, offensively, do you really need him? Or what do they want him to be? And has that been expressed? Yeah, I, I think it has been expressed a little bit. I don't think that they're going to get 2018, 2019, Javi Baez offensively again. Um, I think if you kind of take away the context of his salary, if you have a plus defensive shortstop who has a little bit of power, you know, isn't a total liability at the plate, you could do a lot worse. All right. It can be hard to find shortstops (laughs) at the level. So I kind of think it's almost like resetting, reframing what the expectations for Javi Baez are, you know, when there are fans calling 
for him to to be cut or DFA or, or whatever. It's like, okay, is there anyone better in the organization? The answer is probably no. If you were to find an outside solution, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, so yeah, to to your point, like I think take away the payroll. They want a really good defensive shortstop who can help you out from time to time at the plate and put that in the context of the rest of the team. He's not being asked to be the superstar. He's not being asked to carry the team anymore. Maybe those were the expectations when he signed two years ago, but but that's kind of out the window at this point. Cody, hopefully uh, you got some better weather ahead, man. It'd be nice for you. Yeah, to I hope so. Games. Forget that, bro. You're in New York, dude. Live it up. <laughs> like, why would you all even right, think about sucks. it? Who cares? You can still go to bars and restaurants and have good food. Yeah, so, all right. So, out. so rain out in New York. It's terrible outside. What should I do? What should I do this afternoon? Help me I out. mean, pick a restaurant, pick a bar to go sit at. There's other games on. Right. I don't know if you drink if you drink or if you eat, but I'm sure, sure you do one yeah, of the two. Yeah, have a few beers, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a bazillion places you can go. It's New York. That's true. Right? Yes. I mean, there's. I no, mean, wrong. you can literally go over there and there'll what be a good What kind of food place. do you like? Man, I, I, I like anything. I am looking for a nice dinner tonight, maybe some Italian food or something. Oh, Pratt said he can get in you to Rouse or Carbone. Just call him. <laughs> Carbone, just tell him. Tell him I. Yeah, up. just tell him I sent you. For sure. I'm Cody. I'm gonna send you some Rex. Okay. All right, let's do it. I will send you some Rex after we get off the show. Um, All right, thanks, guys. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, time, I'm jealous yeah. right now. <laughs> I mean, you're in New York with nothing to do. You're in Orlando. Dude, New York and Orlando food scene are a little bit different. <laughs> a little bit, a little right, bit we're, different. We're gonna we're gonna send you some racks later, Cody. But yeah, have, have a time and um, you know, either way, you're either gonna see my shut down the Mets or you're gonna have a good night of food. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can go to you can go to Broadway. I mean, gosh, there's just there's, yeah, there's the a options bazillion things are, just, are limitless. Yeah. That is true. Uh, worst places to get stuck in. Thank you, Cody. Appreciate you, man. All right, thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks. You too. Uh, you can follow Cody um, at Cody, S-T-A-V-E-N-H-A-G-E-N on Twitter. Obviously, we'll It might be the first time I've ever handle. heard anyone go, oh, no. It'd be like, oh, no, I'm rained out in Chicago. Where do I go to dinner? True, true. Oh, no, I'm rained out in New York. Where do I go? Like, wait, just pick. There's a million places. Pick, just go to a corner and point and you'll run into one. Yeah, that's the one. There, there it is. You don't want to even walk far. Like, you won't even get wet. You'll stay underneath yeah. the overhangs. I'm going to send him a, a sushi option. I'm going to send him an Italian option. I'm going to send him a fish steak? option. What about steak? Steak. I feel like no? New York steak houses are not like, their shining moment. I don't know. Like, there's, it's okay. I feel like a lot of other places across the country do, do the steakhouse well. Where in New York, like, you can get a little more um, eclectic. You guys agree? Yeah. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. New York steakhouse, is, obviously it's good, but it's like you can get good steak in a lot of spots. New York, you want to find sushi Italian, like some other yeah. kind of, some fusion and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's kind of your spot. See, like here, good example. Jackson said, go to Old Homestead, have a steak. Agreed. Old Homestead's great, but it's in multiple places. Like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I can steer you in some other directions. Old Homestead and AC slaps. Okay, let's get to Hot Corner. First off, we finished. I got taken over by the sizzle. Finish our Chicago talk. Mm -hmm. The Cubs rocked the Rockies, and the Rockies have been outscored 49-16 in the first six games. The slump buster is Colorado's pitching staff this year. <laughs> I think that's all we need to say. And then second, you know, I had a little interaction with, oh, all right, here's, here's Cody. Mm. You know who could have used Cody Bellinger? Everybody? Seemed like, yeah, everybody. The Rockies? Plenty of teams that could use some offense. The, the Rockies, Rockies, yeah. The Cubs. Mariners. Mm. Go, yeah. Cody, go. Yeah, they mm -hmm. destroyed. They were the chanting his name, too, before that homer. Cody, Cody. Really? It was cool, yeah. And then we have your dude, Jay Kuda. Oh, we, can we get Jay Kuda on, please? I, I talked to him. And? He's just not sure. He's he's more of a behind the scenes guy. So he's going to think he's about hilarious. it. He's hilarious. Told him that 
Oh. You love his content, and oh. he said he loves yours. He said he loves FT. So, working on it. Mm. Got to muster up the courage. Come on, Jay. In baseball history, all teams that were 0-4 with 40 strikeouts and 8 or fewer runs scored after their first four games. 2021 Braves won the World Series. Mm-hmm. 2024 White Sox. World champions, baby. Yeah. I mean, think about that. In the history of baseball, not just this year, 0-4, 40 Ever. punches. Eight or fewer runs for – okay, there's a better one. I just sent Claudia. I don't know if she can build it yet or not. but From him? From Jay Kuda. Through five games, the World Series winning Braves team compared to this year's White Sox team. And it's games played five, wins one, losses four, hits 28, walks 11, walks allowed 19, home run six, slug 329. They're perfectly in line. All you need to do <laughs> is – White Sox world champions who didn't bet on it. We'll let you. Duval, Solaire. Jock Peterson. Jock Peterson. And everyone and else. Eddie Rosario. Yeah. Just athlete. get those four. Yeah. And also have Freed. Mm hmm. You know, Ian Charlie Anderson Morton, when he was good. Ian Anderson before he got hurt. Before he got hurt. Yeah. I mean, just have you know, AJ Minter. Yeah. Kind of a whole different team, but yeah. whatever. Hey, listen, there's hope, White Sox fans. There's hope. I just Besides talked that. to, I just no, talked no, I to our EP. Mark said you can switch right now. You can switch your projections. We normally don't allow this. This late into the season, but you can switch if you want to switch your, your White Sox prediction for the World Series. I mean, I don't understand why. Why wouldn't you? I don't understand what what's there to lose. I mean, it's happened once in the history yeah. of the world, and they won the World Series. Fun fact: there are a ton of people, or at least a good chunk of money, that went towards the Rockies making the playoffs and/or winning the NL Ooh. West. It was a high handle. Were you on that day? Yeah, I was. I still don't get it, but it was real. One it's person. A lot of- one person just going all out, being like, yo, honey, I'm going to get rich, okay? The Rockies, 2024. And she's no, like, No, it probably sounded yeah. more like this. <laughs> honey, guess who you think I'm going to put something on? The Rockies are going to win. Go, the Rockies. <laughs> I, I, I've watched a lot of, I watch obviously a lot of games, but the Rockies. They make a lot of errors. So do the A's. The A's and the Rock. Listen, hey, Chris Katz, he said he wanted to clean up the defense. The defense for the White Sox is better. They just can't hit. Right. But the Rockies' defense, you see, was it yesterday where the inside the park Little League homer where they went into the left fielder's club and then he threw it and they threw it away and the guys were just circling the bases? Was that yesterday? And then the A's, the A's defense, at one point they had Oof. more errors than hits. I mean, it's just. By the way, the White Sox are the Royals. They play D and they can't hit. Yeah, they pitch okay. Gar- by the way, Garrett Rocher threw two. I know it's only two starts. He looks pretty good though. Yeah, nasty. Yes. Nasty. All right. I guess a good yeah, Braves that- lineup. Yes. Yes. Braves made, are impressed. He, that back foot slider he threw a Cunha. If you didn't see it, Google it. It's mm-hmm. on it's Rob Friedman. Ninja. Ooh, baby. So the A's might be moving to Sacramento. <sighs> what up- happened to Las Vegas? <laughs> <laughs> That's later. <laughs> That's twenty ninety eight. So uh, here's Casey Pratt, who is a reporter out there. We've had him on the show. He does a great job covering this mess. So here's what I'm hearing. This is according to Casey. A's met with the city today. This was yesterday. A's meet with Sacramento tomorrow. So that's Wednesday, today. A's have internal meeting on Thursday. Oh, I'd love to be in their internal meetings. Some employees have been told that Sacramento is happening. Layoffs likely incoming. Stay tuned. Sweet. So... A piece of paper from the A's Red Sox game from yesterday was obtained by a famous A's fan, Will McNeil. And it lists some do's and don'ts for the employees. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we should point out a few notables. Anyone want to pick a notable? I'll, I'll start. Product. The product section, it says, if you see anything that says rooted in Oakland, it must be taken down immediately. Try not to highlight product that focuses on the name Oakland. I'm not even making that up. That's a real thing. And and I believe that they're working on authenticating this paper and putting it in the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. No, Seriously. uh, Here's the thing for me. It says notes, attendance, 3,500. They were expecting th- – they got up to 51 12 So they way outdrew their expectations. But when it says at the bottom, attendance, 3,500. That's like something you get in AAA. 
Like literally double A, triple A, we had bigger crowds than them. Salt Lake oh, City yeah. and New Britain, Connecticut. We had way big Memphis. There'd be 10,000 people in Memphis when they built the new stadium there. We were in Somerset for a show last year. That was my first job on weekend nights. It was double that. I thought you were going to point out that they're still not doing gift cards. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I'm like, the fuck? Can I get a gift card one time? Can I get a gift card? Because I'm never coming back to a team that's not going to be here. My favorite is the item of the game. Denim jacket, baby. A denim jacket. Tell me tell me an A's denim jacket wouldn't be fire, though. Tell me if that If it said Oakland be. on it, but they had to strip those down. Nope. It just says A's. A's colors. Ooh-wee. You know Ricky Henderson would wear a denim A's jacket. Plus, Plus sales goal, 36000 Is that for the whole weekend or for the game, the whole week? Or what? <laughs> just know. for the one game. This is sales goal, 36000 Like, is that concessions? Is that only denim jackets? Is that everything? <laughs> uh, they had to, if, if, if they were only expecting 3500 and they got 5000 man, they might have hit they might have hit 40000 Somebody got a bonus. Customer service section. I understand the fan base may be upset with the team, but do what we can to make their experience with us a positive one. That was the one humanizing side of this entire piece of paper. There's like one nice employee or somebody that spoke up and said, hey, let's put something positive on here so that if it gets obtained by someone else, we don't look like absolute monsters. We only look like partial monsters. It's, oh. this, this is rough, man. And that that should go to Cooperstown because one day when people take their kids to Cooperstown and they go, wait, there's a team in Oakland? And they go, oh, yes. And let me show you how they treated fans. <laughs> it is messed up and it needs to be documented. That's what the hall's for. All right, let's get to the Mets broadcast. We talked about it a little yesterday, but now we actually have a look, a little peek behind the curtain of how fun it is to cover a rain delay. Gary Cohen and Keith Hernandez doing their thing in the booth. Well, we'll be here when the game starts. And until then, you guys just, um, you know, get, get the snacks that you can and, and try to uh, keep, keep nourished. <laughs> For the podcast crowd, you got to point out that Gary Cohen made a A plus face. Yeah, I roll. <laughs> but here's 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 my thing. It, you've done games, Scott. Yeah, Crouch, you've done radio. There's nothing worse than a rain delay, especially when like he knew it was going to get canceled. So they're just wasting time. Mm-hmm. Like he could be already home. I don't know where Gary Cohen lives. That's why him and Keith are like, and their eyes are like. Huh. Because it's like, what are we doing? We know we're not playing this game. So why are we here? And why you heard we... his line, too, at the end. Like, and you stay nourished. He's like, Fuck Nourished. <laughs> He's like, I'm done. I'm too good for this. Yeah, it sucks. Rain delays suck. I've had so mm-hmm. many, so many rain delays in life. Why not First just ever... leave that on? Always show, always show the real side of it. Always show the real side. Leave Mike's that always on. Hot. Mike is huh? always hot, Craig. Mike yeah, is always that. hot. Mm-hmm. I love that. So is the camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love it too. I think it was great. Right, this was scary. Byron Buxton almost got truck sticked by the Brewers mascot. Bratwurst. Look at that. Or one of the Brewer mascots. Yeah, the Bratwurst during the sausage race. Polish, to be pro- more specific. Polish, Polish probably won. No. He's a stud. Team Poland. Polish never wins. In the Olympics. Um what if, what if he got knocked and he got hurt? Oh, my gosh. That actually happened to me. It's a close call. That happened to me once. Same thing. I was going out. And they come Because they come out because I was like the last out. So you come out and you're not expecting there to be five large wieners running at you. <laughs> right? Yeah. You always got to be careful about those wieners. It scares you. They're not small either. No. And they're heavy. Yeah. And. I'm not worried about you. You were a durable player. Byron Buxton has gotten hurt a lot. He showed his agility and his spryness. Yes. Can't get me, Wiener. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That's all I got. I mean, that was was nifty. Safety first. Next time I do a game in Milwaukee, I want to to do the race. Prove it. Next time I do a game, I'm going to ask him if I can do it. I've done the slide. I want to 
see if I can be the Polish sausage. They would definitely let you. You would only be the Polish sausage? Well, I mean, I'm Polish. Why would I? I don't want to be the chorizo and I don't want to be the bratwurst. And I don't need, I mean, I, okay, Polish or hot dog. I'm Polish American. Okay. I'll pick. There you go. Bring your belt and just take down the other sausages. Oh, just, I've done that though. I've already done that. I did that in Braves when I took down the people that were that messing with too with the drill. Yeah, but you could still, that that's the move. Just beat the crap just out body, of it. Just body, cross body all four of them. The problem is I've heard of all of them. The race is, the race is phenomenal. The race is you, the race is something that is like it is special to Milwaukee because they actually let people they actually let people run the race. It's not like one of those gimmicks that is oh well we're never gonna let we're never gonna let George Washington win the race. It's like a funny thing. We're never gonna let so and so win the race. It's a funny thing. Like they let people go hard in that, and then they have the little one. So we gotta, we gotta go, we gotta check this, check this. Of what AJ had, he felt so, so loved because San Diego was talking about him in their, in in their game last night while Tatis was up. How much conversation? is actually taking place night in and night out. Usually not a whole lot, but it, it depends. Depends on who the, the who the people are. You know, AJ Brzezinski was here the other day. There would be conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there ever a time when you would say, hey, you know, enough already, uh, I've got a game to call? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, it's like, hey, you know what, hey, I gotta concentrate. Or at least someone's shouting you out. Mike Winters. I had a great relationship with Mike Winters. I don't think he was saying anything poorly. I think he was like, yo, AJ likes to talk. So Former up, he was in the booth. Would you conversate, though? Because it's funny that we talk about him? this. I just thought I MF'd him, but I guess I conversated. <laughs> <laughs> because, I would, because I would conversate, and it's funny that this came up because and Bourgeois – had his whole incident where he had his headphones on and he was sleeping, I mean, in the bathroom, because he was up one time in AAA. And I would just, I would just chat. I'd chat with the umpire. I'd chat, you know, what's going on. And one time he turned around and he was like, shut the F up. Seriously. Like, you're just talking all the time. Stop. And I never thought of myself as somebody that, like, talked all the time. But I guess he had it had enough that day. So that that's what I think of when I see bourgeois coming out late and I see and I see them say what they said about you. <laughs> I mean, what, but what are the so I had the eight thing, the eight screen on direct TV. Yeah. What are the chances that I just happen to have it on the Padre Square at that exact like because you can bounce the little boop boop the voices around? What are the chances, though, that I had it on that square when that and he said that? And I was like, "No way!" Like, out of all the people, out of all the people, Mike Winters, in, you know, umpired in front of, behind, whatever, he picks me out, and I'm like, and then Mud, of course, Mud Grant just starts dying laughing. It was it was awesome. It, it was, was a great. It was really too. funny. It was really funny. So that's part of your subscription. Yeah. That's part of your subscription. Anytime your name is going to be said, it the algorithm automatically automatically goes to that game so aj just feels good about himself <sighs> mike winters right. thank you feels so good one day that will be a thing for sure like keyword hey if you ever hear this word then it was just amazing. take me it was just amazing that that was that that happened i was dying and of course i orsillo i'm firing shots at orsillo because he wasn't even there i'm like orsillo what the hell man i'm not even in town i'm getting blasted by your guys and or he was, he was he was doing the philly games watching bryce at three homers or AJ just stands there and just holds his camera up and records every single game. <laughs> something is said. This is how AJ watches Somebody it. says something about it's like, me. It's like, hey, honey, it's dinner time. Hold on, hold on. I feel like it's coming. I feel, I feel like, like somebody's going to say something about me. He's, hold, he's holding it up and, and eating his food at the same time. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I mean, the, it was the Padres, Cardinals. Like, it was, yes. it was like the most random. Totally you know, right. Maybe maybe if I had fired a, something to Chip Carey, the Cardinals announcer, like, okay, I get, I get something's coming. But, like, for the Padres guys, that was just total. It was all. It was funny. 
I, I remember because I, I didn't, you sent it to us in the group text. I was listening to their broadcast before the game started and they were like, we're so excited. We're going to have Mike Winters in the booth for a little. And I was like, oh, cool. I'll try and catch that. And I caught a little bit, but I didn't catch that exact moment. So yes, the timing was perfect. Thanks to the algo. Let's get to our next guest. Our good friend from the athletic, Britt Giroli, joining us right now. We'll talk a little DC sports. We'll talk Juan Soto. Britt, how are you? Happy baseball season. I'm good. Yeah, I got to tell you guys, I don't know where everyone is, but it's been raining in Maryland for like three days straight. And I'm just like ready to be hot and sweaty at a baseball game. Like make it July now. I, the last three, four times I've been up north and I'm always driving like six hours a day to go from like the different studios up there. It's just always raining. So hopefully it stops eventually. Um, but it is gorgeous down here in Orlando. So if you'd like to come down with the fam and say <laughs> hi, we're here for it. Um, but let's, let's get to Juan Soto first because that's fresh. Just put out an awesome article about him. Give us some context. And I guess what was the most fun part of putting that story together behind the scenes? So I guess, you know, when you're putting together this story, what we kept hearing was that Juan was mad he got traded and that he was sad he was in San Diego. But nobody really told us why that was. And that's kind of what I wanted to do was provide the context as to, you know, what happened to him over the past two years. And I think if you look at, you know, turning down the Nationals offer, uh, going to San Diego, having that slump, kind of refinding himself. You know, Juan Soto, even though he's 25 years old, has been through a lot, right? Like he's lived a lot of baseball experiences. And I think people don't realize that, especially when we're, we're talking about a guy who's a generational talent. The fact that he's already on his third team in three years, it just doesn't happen. So I, I think when you look at Juan, and certainly I covered him on the beat for two years in D.C., he is a different guy. He has matured. I think he's learned the hard way, you know, the business of baseball and all that comes with it. And I think now entering his free agent year, you're really looking at a guy who is in command of his career, uh, of his persona, of where he's at personally. And, you know, I know it's only been a couple of days, guys, but does anybody believe that this guy's not going to have a monster year in that stadium for that team, given where he's at? It just felt like the perfect time to kind of dive in and look back at, at what happened. Brad, do you think he'll beat the 440 on the free agent market after last year's free agency? That was a struggle for a lot of Scott Boras clients. You think he's going to beat the 440? So... I, I mentioned in the article, I talked about a half a dozen agents because I didn't know, like, how do people perceive him? And all but one said yes. And the, the one who said no, interestingly enough, said, you know, it kind of reminds me of a Miguel Cabrera situation where, you know, he could be he could age poorly. We know defensively he has shown some improvement, but you're paying the guy for his bat. And there is some danger in that. And this guy mentioned, you know, Miguel Cabrera's deal in Detroit and how that really didn't age well because Cabrera didn't age well. So I think there is some hesitation, but when you look at a guy like that, if his OPS starts with one, how do you not pay him something over 440? How do you not pay him $500 million? Because he's not 30 years old, right? He's 25. He's going to be 26 in October. I think the age and the skill set, you feel comfortable going for a 10-year deal. Does he get a 15-year deal? Like what the Nationals wanted to offer him two years ago? I don't know if a team wants to go that far. You're talking about a 40-year-old Juan Soto. But in terms of AAV, which is what he's really after, can he beat Otani, which is valued at $43 million present day when you include some of the deferrals? I think he can. He's making 31 as a guy who's still under team control. So I think he's after records. I think he's going to get some records. Is it going to be you know, a record value overall? Maybe not. But there's still going to be something, I think, to hang your hat on. You said he wants the record like he wants the aav record is that juan soto wanting the record or is he more focused on you know whatever scott tells him he wants that's the tricky thing right and and i wrote about it and it's so nuanced i wrote about it you know it, as delicately as possible but they are very close and i talked to scott boris yesterday and he said listen i am his lawyer i give him the information he's an independent thinker and he thinks for himself now that is, you know, that is one side of things. On the other side, you have teams, you know, and you have multiple people who believe that he does trust Boris maybe a little too much, that he does rely on him. And when you do hear some of these quotes, like trying to move the market and thinking about the guys behind you, and you know, when the Yankees reporters ask, 
about an extension and you say they know who to talk to, that to me sounds like someone who has been very well coached, right? And we know that Boris guys are very well coached. So, you know, would it matter if he wasn't such a big deal? Would we care? Probably not. You know, is Juan Soto after these records? I don't know. I, I think that it's really hard to say where where this is coming from and who believes this. I do think they're a very united front. I do think they're very close. Scott Boris told me yesterday he's probably had 50 conversations about Juan Soto's future with Juan. So, you know, I think this is just a case where they together have decided we're going to go to free agency. We're going to get us the most money that we can. And we know that Boris likes to chase that. And it seems like Juan is on board as well. Brett, is there any concern with Juan Soto? And again, I don't know if this is true or not about what happened in San Diego. Do you know what happened in San Diego? Because everything you hear was something didn't work, whether he didn't fit in, whether he didn't fit in with the rest of his teammates. Is there any concern? Now, listen, it's early in New York. Obviously, when you play defense, throw guys out of the plate, hit homers, get hits. Everyone's like, Juan Soto's the greatest. But in San Diego, he didn't fit. Is there any concern heading into his free agency that there's more to the story than we know? It's a, it's a good question, and it's something I tried to explore as best as I could in that story because I agree with you. I mean, I remember going to Arizona last spring, being in the Padres clubhouse, and going up to Juan Soto and, and talking to him for a few minutes. And again, I covered him on the beat. And I remember walking away thinking, this is not the same guy. This is not the same guy I covered. And I think part of that is he was so upset by what happened with the Nationals. He was so jaded that when he got to San Diego, he had a hard time trusting people. He really felt hurt. He felt betrayed. And he goes to this team where we know there were clubhouse issues. We know there were leadership issues. So I think he right away was just distrusting of a new organization. And as I wrote, you know, he really struggled to assimilate himself right away. I think he was in a bad place mentally. The, the team was in a place where there was a lot of different opinions. As the athletic wrote, there was a lot going on between Bob Melvin and AJ Preller, and that kind of trickled all down. And, and I do think that him not hitting well, that first half season he was there, just compounded matters. So, you know, I made sure to note in this that I had multiple people tell me, listen, this guy cared more about winning than arguably anybody on that Padres team. Like he was upset when they lost. I want that to be clear. He is a great teammate in the dugout. He has energy. It doesn't matter if he's struggling or not. You can't tell. But he is a guy who has trust issues. He is a guy that if you have someone there that he trusts and he believes in, he's all in. And I think New York doesn't have to worry about that, guys, because they have Pat Rossler, who has had Soto before when Soto has had success, who has worked with Kevin Long, who, as I mentioned in that story, is a very close friend of Juan Soto. This is his only hitting coach for years and years. So I think a lot of the trouble in San Diego, the things that plagued him, aren't going to be as much of an issue in New York. He knows he's not getting traded. He knows this is, an, this is not something that's out of his control anymore. Right. The Yankees aren't going to just fold the cards in July and say, well, Juan, it's been fun, but go somewhere else for two months. He knows he's in control of his destiny. And I think that brings a little more peace. And that has made it a lot easier to to assimilate to another new group. Is it fair to forget? Most people forget that Juan Soto, he's a World Series champion. Like you talk about how young he is. He's a World Series champion. Can he lean on that? in some of these experiences too? I think so. And I think, you know, I think once guys are stars and you guys know this, Kratzy and AJ, like we want to put the leader label on them like right away. And it's like, they're 22, just because they're a star doesn't mean they're a leader, right? And I think for a guy like Juan, he's kind of growing into that role, right? He's kind of feeling his way around and realizing that what he says and does, does carry weight. And wherever he goes next, no question, he's going to be the guy there. So I, I do think, he can lean on his experience. I do think he was somewhat jaded by, you know, I was there in 2019. He wasn't the veteran. He didn't have to be the leader. He was the young prodigy, the fun Soto shuffle, right? He was just this smiley kid who would follow around Howie Kendrick and joke around that Howie was his dad, right? So he, he felt like DC was a family. And then he felt like that family burned him and betrayed him by exposing this offer and then trading him three weeks later. And I think he never really rebounded in San Diego and he never felt like, you know, this is going to be like it was in D.C. You know, I think he knows it's never going to be like that again. You know, once guys get traded for the first time, and again, you guys can speak to this, you kind of realize this is a 
this is a game, but this is a business, right? And feelings often don't matter. Feelings really aren't something that GMs and front offices should be concerned with. So I think for a guy like Soto, he has so much baseball experience now, winning, losing, going through slumps, you know, having things out in the media that he doesn't necessarily want out in the media, that he does kind of finally have that cachet to talk to guys in New York, to, to say, hey, listen, this is how I did it, to kind of become that leader that I think maybe he wanted to be in San Diego. You know, he maybe wanted to be the star because he had been the star in D.C. when they traded away all of the team. You know, I think he he kind of really struggled to find his footing. He really didn't know where he fit in in that clubhouse. And it got better. It certainly got better last year. He had a better year. Uh, but the team underperformed so badly that, you know, all of these little cracks are going to be exposed. There are trust issues in Baltimore too, Britt. We haven't had you on since the <laughs> sale was official. David Rubenstein taking over. How has it been there? Are people like in euphoria since the team's so good too? Yeah, I mean, let me check. No, no, no missed calls from you guys. So I guess you guys weren't, uh, no one cared what I had to say about that. Uh, <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> yes. We, I mean, AJ would have me on just so he could make fun of me the entire time from being an Orioles fan. Um, no, I think. <laughs> whoa, you know, whoa. First of all, I was in Orioles camp. I, I Didn't I see you there? No, you saw Hannah Kaiser. Oh, thanks wait, no, that was Hannah Kaiser. That's right, yeah. my bad. My we are bad. friends. Right. I do love Hannah. Uh, but thanks for thinking we're all the same. Hannah has pink hair. I was also in, I was in well, Nats I, camp. I get how in, that would be. I was in Nats camp, too. You know, <laughs> didn't I see you in Nats camp? No, you didn't. Wait, that I wasn't will. you either. Thanks for yeah, calling so. me out. Uh, I did not go to Nats camp this year. Thank you. <laughs> I've been working on this. Uh, no, to, to answer the original question, um, it's, you know, it's been, I think people are in shock. The bar is so low. People keep asking me, like, well, is Rubenstein going to be better? The bar is so low when you think about what was going on here with the Angelos family, the payroll that got slashed, the brothers suing each other, just a lot of the drama that all Rubenstein and the rest of his group have to do is invest a little bit in this team. It's just get them out of the bottom of the payroll, right? It's just lock up one guy. The bar is so low that, yes, they're going to be better. People are in actual disbelief. People have been dealing with the Angelos family for 30 years and it feels like a new day. And I was there at the home opener and, you know, it just felt like this is a team that's going places and going somewhere. And, and I know, you know, there are legitimate World Series expectations on the Orioles and there were even before the ownership change. But I think for the first time now, if you're an Orioles fan, you truly believe if this team's in it in July, that Mike Elias is going to be able to do whatever he wants. I had a high ranking official say to me, I'm just glad that Mike Elias finally has a real owner. And that should be scary for the rest of baseball, right? Mike Elias has done this and created this with virtually no support in terms of payroll on the, you know, on the big league side. And yes, they were in a rebuild for a little while, but now you think about this and you think about a new ownership group wanting to make a splash, wanting to prove that, you know, they are in it, that this matters to the community because David Rubenstein is from here and he went to Baltimore public schools and you know, they're going to make a move. You know, if it's close, that they're going to push their chips in. And I think that's a really exciting thing to know that this ownership group is going to want to try to win. And that wasn't always the case before. So Fans, I think, still can't get over it. You know, it, it's really easy to win over a fan base. The ownership group went into a bar, bought a few rounds, and if people didn't already like them, they've now, like, skyrocketed in terms of popularity, right? Free beer. Everybody is in. Britt, next time the Orioles sell, you'll be our first call, okay? The next time the <laughs> Orioles sell their team. You'll, and, or, or the Nats. How about that? The Nats, because, you know, they've been talking about <laughs> selling for years. They haven't done anything. Or... Even better, when the Masson dispute has ended, we'll have you on right oh. away, okay? Just, oh, just yes, to make yes. you, which is never going to happen either. But, but the real question is, who's gonna, who are they going to lock up first? Which one of their young stars? Adley, right? Yeah, that's the only one. Jackson Holiday, Cedric Mullins is older, hey, Austin Hayes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them that are older, too. So which one of these guys, you said only take one, which one is their golden child that they're going to be like, we're picking you to lock up? I think it has to be Adley because when you look at it, Gunnar Henderson is a Scott Boris client. They usually don't sign those like pre pre arb deals. Jackson Holiday is another name I've seen thrown around. That guy's got generational money between his his signing bonus and his family. He doesn't need 
the security. You know, when you go after these guys, you look at who needs the security, who wants to not bet on themselves, to not place that gamble. I think Adley Rutschman makes the most sense in terms of would he be open to it, right? He's a catcher. He's a little bit older than some of these guys. He's certainly a cornerstone. Like they have not been swept in a series since Adley Rutschman came up, which is wild to think about. But to me, he's the guy that you target. Like maybe you get some of these other younger position players eventually if they show, you know, a little bit more Colton Kowser, Heston Kirstad. But to me, Adley Rutschman is the guy that you say, he's staying forever. He's going to be our catcher of the future. He's the cornerstone of this organization. We're going to lock him up. I don't think you have too much of a chance with those other guys. Maybe if you look on the pitching side, Grayson Rodriguez would be the guy that you would try to lock up as well. But I think that, unfortunately, this young core that we talk about so much is going to be nearly impossible to keep together, whether ownership wants to or not. Well, we know you're an Orioles fan because you forgot that the <laughs> Rangers swept that ass in the playoffs. So Regular season, was, Kratz. Regular there season. There was that. I know, and I bet on it in the playoffs, and I lost badly too. So I was, <laughs> I was, hanging, on, I was hanging on Adley Rutschman to keep his streak alive. Is Baltimore – have they recovered from the Jackson holiday going down to triple a, or is it, did they not recover until Jordan Westberg, essentially the person playing his position hit a two run walk off Homer the other night? I think they're still not recovered. I honestly don't think people, I think people are upset because they want to see him up here, whether it was the right decision or the wrong decision. Like we can debate all day. I do think Mike Elias and his group, deserves kind of the benefit of the doubt here, especially because the rules have changed. Like they're not keeping him down because it behooves them and they get an extra RB year anymore, right? That doesn't count. It actually would help them if he came up and he won rookie of the year, like they had with Gunnar Henderson and you get another draft pick. So I, I do think there's a faction of the fan base upset, but if the team is winning and they have this problem that teams would kill to have, they have too many young impact position players. I continue to believe that they're going to have to make some kind of trade probably to bring back pitching because they just can't possibly have all these guys come up at the big league level. So I think people are upset. I don't think they should be upset. I think we're going to see Jackson holiday probably before June 1st. You know, he's, he's a guy that's going down to triple a, he's going to continue to do ridiculous things. He belongs in the big leagues. If he was with any other team, he might be in the big leagues, but for the Orioles, you have to look at it as how can we keep all these young guys? How can we keep our roster as intact as possible? They felt like they were rushing him. The guys had almost no minor league time, if you look at it. It is almost unprecedented how fast he's gone through the system. Their thinking was, hey, let's pump the brakes. Let's give him a month or two to get settled, to feel good about himself, and then let's call him up. Are the Nats the next to be sold? I know they said, oh, we're on the market. Now we're pulling them off the market. Or is that just a ploy yeah. of like, no, 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 I don't like this. Okay, actually, I'll do it. Like the Giants did for the offseason. Free yeah, agents. you know, you know, guys, a, a person who maybe would believe in, I don't know, um, someone who is jaded would think that, you know, myself writes an article that says the learners have to decide. The Nationals disagree with my column. And then a week later, learner says we are not for sale. So they they do decide. Uh, but, you know, anyway, neither here nor mm -hmm. there. Uh, mm -hmm. Water under the bridge. I do think that it's total BS. I think if they get the right offer, they're going to sell. They just haven't gotten the right offer. And, you know, look, you look at what the Orioles sold for. And, you know, I think a lot of people, as Ken and I reported, like thought that that was low. So I think now they're just waiting. They want mass and resolved. And then they kind of have a little bit of a better idea of where this organization is headed. Can we sell? Can we sell for an acceptable amount? If they're not going to sell no matter what, that's fine. I appreciate that. But let's now see them invest in the big league team. I mean, they did not sign any real big big league free agents. I know they're in a rebuild. To me, this is the last year they can get away with that. I think if you look at these young guys coming up and they have an impressive group on the roster right now of young prospects that they've gotten from all these trades. So this to me is the last year they can get away with saying, let's let our young guys play. You have to support these young guys with some veteran players. You have to teach them how to play the game the right way or you know how to not act like the, the sky is falling when you have your first seven game losing streak. Like there is value to those guys, even if you're not trying to win right now. So I think the Nationals are still in a precarious place when it comes to ownership. I would like ownership to come out and definitively say, we're in it to win it. We are gonna start spending. We're gonna take the handcuffs off. And until then, I continue to believe that if the price is right, they're going to sell that team.
And if they do sell, here's the one promise. <laughs> We're going to call you. Are you? Are you guys? No, I'm just kidding. Are we? I'm, listen, I'm a busy person, so maybe I won't answer. Maybe I'll Oh, so you now, now, oh, you got better yeah, options. You weren't busy now. in spring training because you weren't there. Uh, wow. Busy. You know what I was doing in spring training? I was in Arizona, and I was also in Tampa working on that Juan Soto story. So mm. don't act like I was at the beach here, AJ. I was, I was, I was hitting the camps. Maybe I wasn't mm -hmm. on the FT schedule, but that's because no one tells me where FT is going to be. It's a surprise. It is. Next year, we're going to actually It's like it. Christmas. You never know what you're going to get under the tree. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, Britt, well, thank you. And uh, if anyone wants to check out Britt's article, uh, go for it, please. Um, check out her Twitter account or check out the article um, in The Athletic. It just came out. Uh, Britt, thanks. Good to catch up with you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Uh, we'll post some clips from this on all the socials as well, coming up a little bit later on. Let's get into our BetMGM locks for the day. So we'll backtrack first. Heater hit. That's a dub. Sure. Every Tuesday, promo boost. Sorry about it. And Diamondbacks won. Us, Gallon hit his case. You got to keep us FT fans. You got to keep us under wraps here because BetMGM was giving us nice numbers on the boost. And I really, we can check our texts. I texted Scott. I like the under in that game too, but I was getting a little greedy. I was getting mm -hmm. a little greedy. So let's just, just keep us, just keep us. Yeah. Easy. Just pump the brakes, pump the brakes, make sure we stay in our lane. Plus the Diamondbacks were all over Nestor Cortez early in that game. That easily could have hit an over. I mean, they weren't homers, but knock, knock, knock. I mean, they had, I think, like five of their first six batters were yeah, hit. Something three like nothing that. before you woke up. Yeah. Um, Kratz, you nailed your case. Castillo and Bieber. And then AJ missed the SGP, but nailed the White Sox money line. Which was my bonus bet, plus my, F, my MGM heater. And by the way, everything hit perfectly. Seager was up in like the top of the eighth, and he hit a ball, and he pimped the shit out of it. I'm like, there it is. Boom, doubling up. And the dude caught it right on the wall. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, it was way gone in 99% of the parks except for Tampa. Literally, he hit it, and he did his, his normal, like – He I, pimped it? He hit it, and he, does, he doesn't really ever pimp one. But he did it, and it was his normal, like – because he hit one today, and it was like the same swing. And it came off the bat, and I was like, there it is. Hit and RBI in the eighth. Oh, damn it. Morning yeah. time. <laughs> ah, sure. All right, so updated money bags. Here's where we stand. And let's get to our locks. Kratz, would you like to begin? I'm going an easy one. We're going over. Easy Joe one. Mus Joe Musgrove. Oh, it's an easy pick. It's not like it's like my other ones where it's one walk, three Ks, <laughs> seven <laughs> unders, six foul balls. Uh, no, it's the, I'm taking the over in the day game in San Diego, Musgrove versus Zach Thompson. I think these offenses will wake up in the warmth of the sun because I'm completely going against what is going on here in Pennsylvania. No sun, no warmth. Aren't you having a little weather situation too? Where? With your pick? Oh, yeah, the Tigers rained out today. Is it rained out? I don't think it was rained out yet, was it? But I'm saying I don't think you're going to have to keep an eye on yeah, yeah, but your game. That's why I picked that game, because if it gets rained out, I get my money back. And if it doesn't, you think uh, it's postponed. It's postponed, uh, damn it. Well, too knocked. late. All right, well, I win. Nice <laughs> you don't get a green check. You get a void. Yeah, but, I mean, I picked that a long time ago. Detroit, Matt's over, so it was seven and a half. That was, seemed easy to me, I figured. But – me and Gary Cohn, we're just going to keep do, nourishing ourselves. Do your Gary Cohn face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 got postponed. Um, I'm going to go Cubs run line. The Rockies are rough right now. And I, you know, they'll go on a little run. They'll win you know, three out of nine at some point. But for now, I think Cal Quantrill is coming off a clunker. His last start last year against the Cubs was a clunker. I was looking at some of the matchups for him against Cubs hitters. It's, it's not great for him. Cubs have won three in a row after dropping their first two. I'll take the run line. And the usual. So it's plus 105. Hundo to win 105. 
I'll, I'll back. Since I don't have a pick. You're going to pick something? I'll back it. I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll tell, tell that? that? Tell Scott. What, the what was your Scott's? Uh, over, over in the Cardinals Padres game. What's that over under eight and a half? No, I'm taking the Cubs run line. Cubs run line. You know, I'm taking it because it's a win win for me. If they cover, I'm happy. And if they lose, I'm happy. So it's a win win. (laughs) That's a hedge. That's a big thing. Hmm? Hedge. I mean, I'm happy either way. Yeah. First bet, $1,500 offer. When you use the code FOUL, let's talk about it. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into that new account. Place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. It's a big segment coming up next. Well, Injuries suck. Someone got hurt yesterday? Mm-hmm. Love that Nintendo noise. That's the <laughs> MRI nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> the feet were going in the MRI. I don't like that. No feet picks. Anyway, our buddy Kurt Hogue, who covers the Brewers, telling us about the Trevor McGill injury. So he said, add this to the pantheon of weird injuries. Trevor McGill had food poisoning in NYC. Didn't get my rec. And when he returned to Milwaukee, went to a phone store. While there, he fainted and all six foot eight fell to the floor. He ended up with a concussion and is now on the IL. Scary injury. So first off, Trevor, we hope you're okay. Concussions suck. But that is That's one up of there. the that's that's rando. An old timer. I've passed out quite a bit in life, so this is the one part where I can kind of chime in. That's a and, Scotty Braun. That's a Scotty Braun John right there. I, had a, I had a Concussion pass out. Not that really? long ago. Yeah, a year and a half ago. I had yeah. what was the virus that I had? The bad one? Uh, Zika. Not COVID, Zika. COVID virus. No, I was no. in Mexico. I got the mosquito. That's called Montezuma's virus. No, Montezuma's not that one. revenge <laughs> virus. West Nile, thank you. I can't West remember Nile. my own viruses. Uh, so I mean, funny. it was so random. You're I'm in the hospital during New Year's and like all you who's working on New Year's, it's like the super young docs, they're all in there like, we don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And they bring in the infectious disease specialist and eventually, yeah, West Nile virus. But because I had that, that's why I had crazy fevers and stuff. And mm. I just fell backwards, concussion. Got it. And so there you go, Trevor and McGill. They tried to your take, and, it sucks. and they tried to take your kidney out because they're like, let's do surgery on him. <laughs> yeah. We're young hey. and we are ambitious. And we're drunk. New Year's. No, they were dead. Um, <laughs> you mentioned the MRI machine. Yeah. Crouch, you can't fit in a regular MRI, do you? Oh, my gosh, no. They put me in. They put me in one one time, yes. All the others were open air. Oh, because when I had – remember when I had all the chair problems and I needed a new chair that I had to buy myself? Um, <laughs> I still have one coming for you, but we'll get Eventually. Into that. But anyway, so I went and had to go get an MRI on my back, and I went to one in – no chance. Couldn't fit. No. The, the lady gets, she starts putting me in. You have to cross your arms, which makes you way. So I start, I get to the, where the little tube is and I had to go like this with my shoulders because it was not wide enough. And then she, and then she gets to about the tube. If you've never been in MRI, the tube is literally like this far from your face. So close. And the lady goes, how you doing? And I go, I'm not going to fit. And she's like, yeah, we'll keep going. So she gets to about right here on my elbows, and I'm like, and I they have a little button, and I'm like, eh, eh, eh. And she's like, what's the matter? I'm like, I'm not gonna do this. I gotta sit like this for 40 minutes. There's no way, and I'm not claustrophobic at all. And she's like, what do you mean? And she then she came in there and she goes, yeah, we're gonna need a regular, a bigger sized machine. For you. Couldn't need a bigger because there was no way because you can't touch the top boat. either. There was no way I I, I couldn't. There's no way because like she would never got past my elbows. That's such a classic. Doc or, or nurse move to be like, oh, you'll fit. Don't worry. Because there's probably some people that get scared and they're claustrophobic, but no, they're like, I'm not that at all. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it's fine. We get that sometimes. Like, no, I'm not going to fit. I'm a large human. Nope. I fit. I fine. fit the one time. I fit the one time because they had me put just my one arm up over my head. So I had to keep my arm up over my head for that 40 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it was. That, that helped? 
Oh, it's the worst. It made that me, helped you sit? It made no, me you're just laying like this. Oh, you're just geez. laying like this. Straight up in the air? Jeez. Like, yeah, like that. <laughs> or have you ever had to do, when I, when I broke my, uh, my, my hand, I had to lay like this. You have to put your hand up and down. You have to lay like this, and you're on your stomach for 40 minutes, and don't. And they're like, "Don't move." And you're you're like, "Okay, well, eventually, I'm going to get tired of laying." And yeah. You can't move your head, and you're just like, "All right, I'm going to get tired of this." Yeah. How, how do you expect me not to move? They're asking too much. It's got to be a better way. Somebody invent that, please. They have it. Trevor McGill is six eight. By the way, that's a that's a fall. It's a big dude going down. Right on his head. Hmm. How come yeah. no one caught him? You what? How come no one caught him? No one was there. Then he was by two people would have had concussions. <laughs> Slap hands. Uh. <laughs> Who on the slap hands highlight? Who on the slap hands highlight is going to be first to not be on the team? I'm always interested in those slap hands (laughs) highlights. Be like, who's not going to like Joe Espada? He's not even a he's not a bench coach anymore. Now he's the manager. He's on there high five and Tucker. Anyway, this is what ADD gives you. Yeah, I mean, well, Jonah Himes on there. He's definitely not going anywhere for a while. mm -mm. Yeah, Leclerc due for an extension soon. Congrats, George Springer. Hit 10 years of service time. We'll give you a bigger cheers if you come on the show. So we'll work on that. Happy so birthday, good. Jason Kipnis, our buddy. Mm-hmm. Happy birthday, We're, Kip. Yep. See you on hey. Friday. Kip was in Orlando. Didn't even show. Didn't even see us. Well, we're going to let him know about it. Mm-hmm. See you Friday, virtually, even though we could have hung out. Could have gotten even a better hookup at a golf course. Could have got a better hookup at Universal or Disney, but mm-hmm. didn't ask. Mm-hmm. Need, I need that hookup. How do I not know about that? What is that hookup? Oh, yeah. Florida residency or that's a, I know a guy. We're both. We've, we've kind of established I know people at this point, right? Yeah. <laughs> he knows, he knows. Who I thought that was just a given. I thought that was just a given, but it will, yeah, for you, no. For other people, maybe. I actually have a guy for one of the parks, my barber's oh my God. family Stop member. It. Stop, there. It. Stop Wait, it. Stop it. Wait, he was telling me that he can walk me in or something. I was like, I don't, are you sure? He's like, that's yeah, gotta I can be walk a you in. Disney, yeah, Disney. He's like, I, I, he's like, I could walk you in. I was like, that feels. Is that allowed? No, Just walk it is part yeah. of the, no one can walk you in, like to the yeah. side or something. Oh, okay. No, you, you still go through the main thing, but they have to be there, which is the problem. So the employee has to walk you through. Yes. Oh, okay. But if he works there, he can walk me through. I'm saying the family member. Yeah. Can come get but me. But I think they only get a certain amount of those. Okay, that's why I'm like, all right, let me. Yeah. My brother-in-law works there this. with his wife, and they've walked. They've walked. They've walked me in. Before. They walk you in. That's at Disney. My barber's, my barber's cousin's <laughs> uncle's yeah. friend's neighbor. Third, third. That's what they happen. do down here, Kratz. Okay? Third removed. You bring something Sounds- up, and they're friendly. They go, "Oh, I actually can get you in." And you're like, "Oh, I didn't ask, but okay." Sure. Sounds like the sounds like the Orlando baseball team. Orlando Dreamers. Sounds like a dream. <laughs> Not happening. Free, free. Scott will take three. <laughs> I'm free down. Nine nine. Three ninety nine, baby. Kratz, you got a little car story for us? Uh, this is what AJ doesn't know about. Getting called up from a game in Rochester, New York, and a car delay goes a little bit, gets delayed a little bit. At noon, Ricardo Pinto, Matt Gelb, our short little friend from Philadelphia, <laughs> tweeted this out, was in Rochester playing for the Iron Pigs. He gets stuck in traffic and shows up in the fourth inning. So what did Topper do? Rob Thompson, manager? He's like, all right, go warm up. You're, you're in the game for a four-inning save. Appreciate you. Throwing tons of splitters. And they let him out there. He gave him a few runs in the fourth inning. Still got the four innings done. Legit. But that's the minor league life. Getting a call up from Rochester. Right now in Rochester, you think it's cold and wet here in Pennsylvania? Rochester, I'll never forget walking to the field for a day game, and it was 23 degrees. They have the thermometer and the clock out in, like, right field, just left of the bullpen that's in direct right field, but it's just left. And you could see it as you're walking to the field. It said 23 degrees, 
10:22 p 10:22 a.m. and we were playing a we were playing a day game for in in Rochester, New York, frozen tundra of America. You know who cares? Hmm. Kratz's mom. That's it. No one else. Cares. <laughs> oh, Nobody wow. else cares. No, everybody cares when it's 22 to no, when it's 23 degrees at 10:20 no, in Rochester. You are so thankful that a car gets caught in traffic and drives you from Rochester all the way to Philly to play in a rain, rainy, rainy game, and you get four innings in. Like that's exactly what that's exactly the life of right, a triple so amateur. I, I told the story on here when I was with the Braves. We were in Philly and we called up some pitcher, never met him, wasn't in big league camp, literally comes into the game in like the seventh inning, and I am like, hi. I'm AJ. I forget who his name was, but oh, never yeah, yeah. never met him. No idea who he was. Hey, nice to meet you. He literally yeah, threw him in. Like, he got there in like the fourth inning and then like the eighth inning. Here he came. I was like, oh, hey, how are you? Hey, let's do some oh. ball together. Hey, but by and, the way, and, and by the way, this happened to me, so I don't want to hear your oh, bullshit about minor leagues. It happened to me, so. Stop it. Once. It did. Once. You think it's going to happen to Ricardo Pinto again? Probably not. Yeah. Happened to yeah. me once. Ricard, Ricardo actually, Pinto. It actually happened to me twice, believe it or not. Come on. One time one time I was in Oakland, going to Oakland, and I landed in San Fran, got cut in traffic, was late for a day game. Got thrown into the game. Brad Radke never caught him ever. Brad, what do you want me, what do you want me to call? Use the force, bro. You'll be fine. Great line. He said that? Uh-huh. I go, what, what do you <laughs> throw? What do I need to that. call? And he goes, just use the force, bro. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> All right. And then one time I went to Minnesota. Then the next year, that was 99, 2000, I get called to Minnesota. Last time I ever was in AAA, get called back up, get to the day game, get it there in like the second inning, unloading my stuff in the locker. The bat boy runs up and goes, hey, by the way, you need to get dressed because you're going in the game as soon as you're down there. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, our other catcher's hurt, so you need to get in there. They need He just was waiting for you to get here. TK wants you on the bench now. I ran down there and threw me in the game. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm here. That's, Go get him. That's real. Archimedes Camarena. Remember that name? Yes. Can't miss Pirates. it. I love him in Batman. Great assignment. Pirates. 30. Yeah, Archimedes. I like that. I think he was like 97 to 101 sinker. Chris Stewart gets hurt. I got to the game. I got to the game at 710. Already started. I stroll in. I got traded to the Pirates. And they're like, Hey, you know, you know, Stewie's probably going to be fine. He gets hurt in the seventh inning. I come in, and the first guy I got to catch, never even, never met the guy. Never met the guy. Fortunately, I'd already been in the big leagues. Not, you know, not getting called up to the big leagues as a rookie, but I had already been in the big leagues. I flew from Fresno the night before, get there at 7, t- or th- that day, get there at 7, 10, and Archimedes Camarena is throwing 101 sinkers into my thumb. Appreciate that. Pass ball right out of the gate. Good to go. Here we go. You guys are legends. And Ricardo Pinto. This is why people have hope playing baseball. He got seen because Pat Gillick wanted to watch was watching a was watching a uh a winter ball game and they were like oh it was like the winter ball finals and he did unbelievable for i think it was for venezuela i should know exactly. well, it, was, it was ozzy's team was it ozzy's team venezuela mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and he did well he did he was like two and oh with like a 0.86 era that's how he got picked up so if you think they're not watching they're watching kratz hats this is for everybody in Fenway. It's getting a little cold up there. They're actually going to get to play a home game at some point, but we'll see. But this is for Jer, the Sox. Story I always tell. I got to look at my hat. I was number 46. Got to keep my jersey with the Red Sox that I never wore. They gave me a gray jersey, and I only dressed for home games. So, neat story. That was like shed a tear. It's the hat and jersey I never wore. It's like Moonlight Graham. Save, <laughs> the, kid from, save the kid from choking on a hot dog. Mm. That's about By what way, I did in Boston, yes. 
Uh, I'll go. I'll go. B plus on that one. Yeah. See. Mid. It's mid. Mid. Joey Bart to continue that story. Actually, got traded from the Giants to the Pirates, so the Pirates have another. Well, where's he fit high in? Pick. Well, where's he fit in? Delay's going on the yep. IL. Who uh, is? Delay's hurt. Oh, Delay's hurt. So he'll. Delay's oh, he has Monty Grandal. He's got Planner Fash. I mean, when's he coming back? Hurt. Never. And I hate Planner fasciitis. Oof. I will punch Andy it. Andy Rodriguez in the face. is hurt. Andy Rodriguez out for the year. He had Tommy yeah. John, but They're Henry Davis. So if, when Yasmani comes back, what do you, do you have? Bart and Henry Davis. Or you DFA him. Which one? Bart. Yeah, DFA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not DFA. I mean, what yeah, if Bart goes out and just starts banging? Good problem. Pirates don't often have those things. Good problems. How many so. teams have three ex first round catchers on their roster? One, the Pirates. I want to finish with this. Congratulations, Jackson Churio. First big league homer for the Brewers. Youngest Brewer to homer since Gary Sheffield in 1988. Oh, Gary. Oh, bug. Smooth jazz for Jackson. See everybody on Thursday.